Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, on this uh, bright, sunny, autumnal day, or it is where I live anyway. So welcome to this second episode in the series. So on Tuesday, we had more of a sort of um, an overview, an introduction uh, to um, the uh, what we're going to talk about in the sessions this week and next week. So today we're getting into a bit more detail on innovation in the supply chain. So it's my pleasure to welcome Matt Wilson, who will be giving the first presentation. So Matt, if you can just give a brief introduction to yourself and then follow into your presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thanks Peter. So I'll just uh, share my screen so we can jump to the presentation. So hopefully you can see that. Is that all working? So, um, yes, I can see it now, Matt. Thank you. Fantastic. So thank you. Thank you, Peter. And good morning, everyone. Uh, so my name is Matt Wilson. I'm a senior consultant at Element Energy. Um, I spent a little bit over two years now working in our hydrogen team, uh, working mainly on mobility and industrial decarbonisation. Um, so I've, uh, I've worked on the Gigastack project since its inception back in December 2018 through both stages of uh, funding application, the feasibility study, and the ongoing feed work, as well as some parallel work on the Green Hydrogen for Humber project, uh, which I'll also talk to you later. Um, so I'm here to talk to you about the Gigastack project, uh, why this project is both important and timely, uh, and some of the innovation that surrounds, uh, that we're investigating into the bulk supply of renewable hydrogen. So without further ado, I'll crack into this. Um, I'll do a quick intro to Element. So we're a specialist energy consultancy uh, working across areas of low and zero carbon energy. Uh, we consult on both uh, technical and strategic issues across smart electricity and gas networks, energy storage, low carbon transport and built environment. But today we're mainly talking about our work in the red boxes, so that's hydrogen and industrial decarbonisation. So with a little over 20 years experience in the, in the hydrogen sector, we work across the supply chain. So that's production through conditioning, storage, distribution and end use. Um, but today, again, we're focusing on production and electrolysis mainly. Uh, and for those that aren't too sure, electrolysis is where you're splitting water into hydrogen and oxygen using uh, renewable electricity uh, or electricity. And where that electricity is renewable, you're then producing uh, renewable hydrogen. So I just, sorry, I just moved out there. Brilliant. So quickly painting the picture on, uh, on where we are and why this is important. And I'm sure a number of people will do this today, so I won't spend too long on it. Um, but effectively, it's well recognised now that the macro picture for green hydrogen is accelerating quickly. Um, this is in part due to technology advances in the, supply, in the hydrogen supply chain, but also in the wider energy system. So we have falling renewable energy costs uh, with increased penetration into the energy system. Uh, and renewable hydrogen is becoming uh, more of a hot topic with talks of balancing uh, this intermittency uh, with needs to balance uh, the, the storage over a longer time frame than just a single day that you get with batteries. Uh, and there's also talks about much larger targets. So we're seeing a number of reports coming out talking about uh, many gigawatts of deployments by 2030, uh, 2050, and that the time is right for hydrogen now. Uh, and this is being matched uh, at the member state level in Europe and by the EU itself, we've talked of tens of gigawatts, uh, recent strategies announced by France, Germany, Holland and Portugal, um, as well as the EU itself with a target of 40 gigawatts by 2030. And we're, and we're seeing this, we're, we're seeing this sort of ambition and how it's carrying across into announced electrolyzer projects. And this isn't exhaustive, but we can see over the past five years that we've had deployments of the order of one to 10 megawatts. But now we're talking about um, so 100 megawatt level, 200 megawatt level deployments by the mid 2020s. Uh, and Gigasat's highlighted there at the, at the 100 megawatt level, uh, mainly these larger projects are for industrial purposes. But to get there and to get to this gigawatt scale ambition, we need equal levels of ambition and innovation uh, to, to match. So, the, the, so on the electrolyzer side, for example, uh, yes, we've had these one to 10 megawatts um, deployments, for example, the 10 megawatts refine project, and these projects are showing that the technology is commercial, but it's not yet scalable. And so we need stack capacity that is low cost. We need new stacks that are low cost and are at such capacity that they can be integrated into larger systems, these 500 megawatt gigawatts uh, systems. And we need a manufacturing capacity to match. So your gigawatt scale manufacturing capacity. 
uh, on, the, on the renewable hydrogen cost side, we can see in the figure on the right, whilst I can't give um, the cost of hydrogen from this project, we can look at the relative cost components. And electricity makes up to about 80% of the cost of renewable hydrogen. And this is again dominated here, a UK grid example, by about 59% grid fees and only 41% the actual price of electricity. So we need to work out ways of maintaining renewable electricity supply, but accessing low cost power in the process. And then finally, uh, there needs to be policy, regulatory, and, uh, and policy and regulatory changes. So strong capital and operational support, uh, a, st a strong market design for hydrogen. So you have confidence in the, for the existing supply chain and also bringing in uh, external actors into the market and having hydrogen as part of national and EU policies on energy. And we're starting to see that coming out at, at the moment. And what this eventually allows us to do is make renewable hydrogen competitive. This is competitive with low carbon hydrogen, fossil hydrogen, and even and eventually natural gas. And the, the talk I'm doing today, uh, GigaStack, is focusing on the first two points mainly, uh, the electrolyzer technology uh, and forming these electrical connections. So first, a bit of an overview about the GigaStack project. So it's, it's funded by Bayes Low Carbon Hydrogen Supply Competition, and it brings together an ambitious consortium. Uh, that's ourselves Element, ITM Power, Orsted, and Philips 66 to prove economically viable hydrogen at scale. So it's doing this by developing new electrolyzer technology for at scale production. And it's also coupling one of the largest offshore wind farms in the world, that's Hornsey 2, with a capacity of about 1.4 gigawatts, with the largest carbon emitting industrial zone in the UK, that being the Humber, with a carbon footprint of about 12.4 megatons of CO2 per year. Uh, and this is based really in the southern part of this cluster in Immingham, which is south of the river and is the region's most carbon intensive area. And we're exploring ways in which we can support this area on pathways to net zero. And this is being done for industrial collaboration. And this is a really important point. We're bringing together, um, this consortium effectively brings together companies from across the supply chain and, and different sectors to find a way to decarbonize, in this case, with renewable hydrogen. So starting with the stack technology, uh, I've talked about the, the barriers in terms of cost, capacity, and scale uh, of manufacturing scale. And so IT and Power are currently developing their next generation, their fourth generation stack. This simplifies design, reduces the footprint, and increases the stack capacity. So looking at the figure in the bottom right, um, we have four stacks making up two systems for 10 megawatts. For the third generation, we needed 15 stacks. And for the second generation, there's a number of stacks there. I didn't actually have time to count, but it's an awful number. And so you can see here the progression and the increase in size. And so one of these systems, i.e. two stacks, is capable of 2.1 tons per day and is really being developed for these 50, 100, 500 megawatt uh, production plants of the future. Uh, ITM expecting to have their first prototype in June 2021. Uh, and to be able to, to supply the technology commercially before 2024. So just in time for these, uh, for these 100 megawatts to gigawatt scale deployments that we're going to be looking at from the mid 2020s. On the manufacturing side, GigaStack is also supporting the development of the world's largest polymer electrolyzer membrane electrolyzer factory. So at its peak uh, by the mid 2020s, it will have a, a production capacity of a gigawatt uh, so that's one gigawatt of electrolyzers per year. This is achievable through uh, moving from handmade electrolyzer systems through to semi-automated uh, uh, semi -automated manufacturing. Um, and this is expected to really commence from the end of this year. And GigaStack is currently looking at exploring the semi-automated technology and supporting the preparation of this factory. And so what does this do in terms of cost? So effectively this manufacturing volume being able to uh, produce these stacks via semi-automation, having a larger systems and continuous technology improvements, we can see drastic cost reductions through time. So today we're looking at around a thousand euros per kilowatt, and this is expected to come down by as much as 50% by the mid 2020s at the 500 euros per kilowatt level and reaching 400 euros per kilowatt by 2030. So we're making significant strides against the capital cost component and the ability to actually get to these large scale or produce these large scale installations. But as I said earlier, this is not the, the main cost component. That's the cost of electricity. And so Element Energy and uh, Orsted worked together on a feasibility study in 2019 to explore ways in which we can access lower cost renewable hydrogen. 
So there are four scenarios we looked at. The first was grid-connected electrolyzers. So this is what you see, for example, in your hydrogen refueling stations across the UK and places like Germany, where you have flexibility in where you can site your electrolyzer. But in this way, it's exposed to the distribution costs and the transmission costs. And so the cost of renewable hydrogen remains high. This is palatable for some markets, such as passenger cars, which can get away with a higher parity fuel price. Um, uh, but it's, it's not going to suit all markets. And so, for example, scenario two brings the electrolyzer much closer to the point of electricity generation. Uh, so here, the electrolyzer is connected to a substation via a private wire. And this private wire in this way, depending on future uh, legislation, is not exposed to uh, grid fees. Or, and, and in that way, it minimizes it. But there's still some flexibility here in accessing electricity from the grid for, for top up in supply. And I'll talk about this in a moment. Scenarios three and four are longer term. So scenario three is where you form a direct connection between your electrolyzer and individual turbines. So in this way, you're able to access a levelized cost of electricity from the wind farm. Uh, your solution is actually tailored. So there's no redundancy in engineering, in, uh, in capital equipment. Um, and there's improvements in efficiency in terms of conversion of, of, um, of voltages and ACDC, that sort of thing. Uh, and finally, scenario four is offshore electrolysis. Um, I know I'm followed up today by uh, some a team presenting the Dolphin project, which is looking at offshore production. So I certainly won't talk too much about this, but it's an exciting option to bring the electrolyzer incredibly close. Again, further integrations and reducing the costs associated with transmitting um, electricity back shore instead focusing on hydrogen transmission or distribution. Gigastack is really focused on the scenario too. So in this way, the substation has both import and export capacity uh, capabilities. So it can export electricity to both the electrolyzer and the grid. And the electrolyzer can interact with the grid as well. So uh, accessing certain markets like the imbalance market. Now, the way in which you operate the system and the way in which you form these connections is entirely end use specific and is going to be go on a case by case basis. So where, for example, an end user wants a fixed level of supply, you want to maximize the amount of electricity you're generating and uh, or your electrolyzer is consuming. So there are some example generation options or operational options at the bottom here. So for example, baseload operation is where your electrolyzer uses as much electricity as it can from the offshore uh, wind farm and tops it up with the grid. So in this way, you're still exposed to grid fees, but your, the majority of electricity comes from um, the renewable energy generation assets. You've got pro rata, where you're only taking electricity from the wind farm and this is proportional to the amount it produces. You've got full electrolyzer lows, where the electrolyzer effectively swallows as much electricity as it can from the offshore electricity generation assets, irrespective of the price of electricity. And finally, you have your optimized load, where you're taking into account that price of electricity uh, and, and effectively uh, on a daily basis, balancing out the, the production uh, of and the consumption of electricity. Um, and so in terms of cost, if we're focusing purely on the base load, and just as a reminder, that's where you're using grid electricity as well. Uh, and in this scenario too, we can greatly reduce the total cost of renewable hydrogen. Now, again, I can't show specific costs because these are confidential, but we can look at the relative cost components. So starting with the CapEx, even with the falling electricity costs, the system CapEx reduces by about 6.2%, and that's due to this new technology. And so effectively, it becomes much smaller and you can get away of operating at lower load factors and greater flexibility. On the cost of electricity side, yes, the fraction increases, but the, um, but the, 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 the makeup of this, uh, of this electricity cost becomes dominated by grid, uh, becomes, goes from being dominated by grid fees at 59% to only about 17%. So this is dominated by the purchase power agreement price and the wholesale price of electricity. Um, and there are also other further ways to reduce this cost of electricity. So beyond just forming this private wire connection, there are other op um, oper operational strategies. So for example, you can choose to turn your electrolyzer off at certain parts of the day through arbitrage on red band hours and CM levies. So for example, the figure at the bottom shows between, between four and 7.30 in a certain part of the UK, uh, the electricity costs are much higher. So you can choose to, choose to turn off during these periods. You can access revenues and lower cost electricity from accessing the imbalance market. So you respond to signals um, in, the, uh, in the market uh, and the electrolyzer has the ability to ramp up and ramp down in sub-second time. 
to provide these levels of flexibility and bring balance to the market. You can access uh, the energy intensive industries exemption on green levies. So green levies, again, make up a significant fraction of the cost, 33% um, in a grid-based system, and even again, 9% here. And effectively, you can reduce that cost by up to 80%, where the majority of your operational costs are electrical. Um, and finally, uh, the, the, the low, the, you can access lower cost renewable power through time. So we've seen that this cost, these cost curves are coming down um, quite aggressively. And third round auction CFDs went for £39.65 uh, per megawatt hour. So this makes uh, the, the cost of electricity incredibly low. And it's important to note, uh, again, I, I'll just make the point that these operational strategies are highly dependent on the end use case. And if you're bringing this levels of flexibility into your operation, you need to account for increased levels of storage, whether that's before the electrolyzer in form of batteries or after the electrolyzer in forms of compressed hydrogen storage. And you also need to balance it off in terms of what infrastructure already exists and, and you need to optimize each case accordingly. So this work has shown that low cost renewable hydrogen is achievable. Um, and, and these scenarios are really define the work going on in Gigastack phase two. This work aligns with some of the work we're seeing in other reports, such as McKinsey and company, that show that renewable hydrogen can compete with blue and gray and even methane. And if we take some of these assumptions, so 500 euros per kilowatt for capex, levelized cost of electricity with these strategies going below $50 per megawatt hour, and a load factor in excess of 50%, we can get down to about £2.50, which I've highlighted here, or $3.20. Uh, and the light green is where you're competitive with blue hydrogen. This green here, uh, the, the middle green is where you're competitive with gray hydrogen. And the dark green is where you're competitive with natural gas. So there is a pathway here. And the, the recent report by the offshore wind industry catapult has really highlighted the importance of investing today. So the cost of hydrogen today, according to their study, is about £5.20. But work in the, in the 2020s through innovations such as these can reduce the cost by as much as 58%. Uh, on the levelized cost of hydrogen. And through time, hydrogen can become the low, renewable hydrogen can become the lowest cost form of hydrogen, uh, beating blue SMR with, or SMR with CO2 uh, capture and ATR with CO2 capture. Uh, and so again, to highlight, this is the importance of investing today, exploring these innovations and the importance of projects such as Gigastack. And so this is why really this feed study work is ongoing and why the partners are engaged in the ongoing feed study in the Humber. Um, they're working on an engineering on engineering works for this system. So everything from the water supply, electricity supply, the electrolyzer itself, and the, the ends, um, the infrastructure changes at the refinery. We're working on offtake agreements, tendering work that would be required, and assessing these challenges, the technical, regulatory, and commercial barriers for these real-world deployments. And if, if this project is successful, we'd be looking at drafting agreements and applications for a next step, which would effectively mean deployment in the mid-2020s. In terms of the, the actual strategic importance of this area, uh, you're, you're, you've got the close proximity of the, Hall, the Orsted substation, Hornsey 1 and 2, and the Phillips 66 Humber refinery. The refinery itself is an existing hydrogen consumer, uh, and you're able to, make uh, to take advantage of the existing hydrogen infrastructure. So this can be used for um, removing impurities such as sulfur in, in the hydro treating of refinery products, refueling of refinery heaters. So uh, replacing fossil hydrogen and natural gas if you can go above the 40 percent level they currently operate at and also expanding so uh, using renewable hydrogen in their production of battery coke um, and this is particularly exciting because effectively you have renewable electrons going into renewable hydrogen molecules going into this graphite which goes in battery electric vehicles so it's truly the production or supply chain of the future and as i alluded to before there's ambition to go beyond this so the green hydrogen for humber is supported by um, the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund competition, which looks at um, basically expanding uh, decarbonisation industrial clusters. Uh, so the Green Hydrogen for Humber project, oops, sorry, looks at uh, expanding effectively beyond this uh, supply of hydrogen just to the Phillips refinery uh, and looking at other industrial users of hydrogen or potential users of hydrogen in Immingham and more widely as well and starting to think about how we can create a gigawatt scale cluster. So this considers uh, the feasibility of connections, the cost, the business case, uh, and engage with stakeholders to start to form stakeholder groups so that they can be informed as, as uh, things change throughout the 2020s. And this work has informed the ongoing Gigastack work. So again, improving the likelihood of success in this project. 
So what does this mean for renewable hydrogen? Um, effectively, GigaSAC is showing that there is a pathway for bulk supplies of low cost renewable hydrogen from the mid 2020s. This is coming from next generation stack technology, which is reducing stack cost, increasing efficiency and, this, and the capacity. So there's gigawatt scale uh, manufacturing to match to, to get to these level of ambitions. Uh, we're forming these connections um, in, the, in innovative ways so that we can access low cost renewable power and there's operational flexibilities, which will be tailored on an end use cases, on an end use basis, um, so that the, the end user has access to a guarantee of supply and low cost hydrogen. And these innovations are really spurring on this activity we're seeing in the Humber region. So it's aligning uh, and it's aligning with other regional projects. And that's important. There's a lot of work going on in the Humber. Renewable hydrogen is certainly going to be an important component, particularly in the longer term. And this can deliver short term decarbonisation. Uh, whilst other infrastructure is developed. And so we see here, we're coming from the point today where we're commercial, we're not at scale, high electricity costs and a small market size. We're working through a feasibility study where we're proving the concepts. We're working now on the feeds uh, and where this is successful, we're going to be able to get to the point where we can deploy physical hardware, uh, depending on phase two results, always the caveat. And this will be able to demonstrate a blueprint for other industrial clusters, for other deployments, and create a UK electrolyzer export market. But it's important to note that just engineering and, um, and innovations such as this uh, are not the only solution. Um, we need to ensure that there's government support but in kicks to maintain this decarbonisation activity. The figure on the right here shows um, uh, the price of hydrogen needed to be competitive with other low carbon uh, fuels for different markets. And the lines here, the dark blue is the cost identified in the mid 2020s that we've talked about, the $3.20. The red line is the 2030s, where we've got the low two pounds a kilo. And the green is, uh, is the sort of one pound 60 defined in the offshore wind industry catapult report. And we can see that we slowly start to reduce this gap but for up to the next 30 years. And so operational support mechanisms need to be introduced. Capital ones will remain important for getting over those initial hurdles operational support mechanisms that go beyond, for example, the current RTFO, that's the Renewable Transport Fuels Obligation for Transport. Uh, so we need a mechanism such as CFDs to bridge this gap. And really, the sooner we can get this investment and, the, and the, the more aggressive it can be, we have the opportunity to go down this cost curve further, access these lower costs more quickly and reduce the impact on the state. So my concluding remarks, um, the UK government really has the opportunity here to facilitate the creation of a world leading centre of excellence in and global exporter of these renewable hydrogen technologies and practices. This won't just benefit the industry sector, but also transport, heat and power generation. So for power generation, it means that offshore, that renewable generation assets can become more widespread, dedicated for uh, the production of renewable, renewable hydrogen, and this can help bring down costs further. Um, Stacking also for operators of electrolyzers, accessing multiple markets and, and incentivizing that there, can lead to uh, also reduced impact on the state, since you can start to stack revenues and leverage higher value markets such as transport against the ones that you're supplying for industry, reducing the overall loss. And effectively, and, and the Offshore Wind Industry Council has predicted this could create up to about 120,000 newly skilled jobs, with 48 billion per year in exports to Europe and 320 billion cumulative GVA uh, in 2050 from integrating the offshore wind industries uh, with renewable hydrogen production. So that, that's been my sort of overview of the innovations in, that's going on in Gigastack. Uh, a little bit of a look at the future. Um, and I'd be happy now. I think we've got a few minutes for some Q&A if, uh, if there are any questions. So thank you for listening. OK, thank you very much, Matt, for that very detailed presentation of this groundbreaking Gigastack uh, project. Uh, looks very encouraging, the work that's being done. So we have uh, a few questions from the floor. So um, does the, the intermittent electricity input rather than operating at static load, in other words, how much, how much of a negative effect does intermittent operation have on the, on the TCO? Yeah, so obviously for all capital equipment, whether that be the electrolyzer or the, um, the other infrastructure required, so that, whether that be storage or compression, which wasn't really looked at here, the, the, the less you use your electrolyzer and the, 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 the lower um, the, the less the slower your output, the higher the capital cost component.
And that's why it's so important really to generate this new to generate this new technology, which is lower cost. If you're using the technology that is in excess kilowatt or a thousand pounds per kilowatt, um, you're exposed to these high capital costs. And so the impact becomes much more significant. But when you get to sort of sub 400 pounds kilowatt, which is what we're really talking about with the Gigastack technology, um, yes, there's an impact, but you need to balance that against the um, against the, the benefits you come from avoiding certain high cost electricity um, hours. Uh, and when you pass a certain scale, you've got certain learnings and the cost of capital is, is low enough. The increase in cost gets outweighed by the reductions in your cost of electricity. And so that's why we talk about in 2050, you, you talk about operating electrolyzers as sort of 30 to 40 percent load factor rather than today you're talking about 80 to 100 percent so it's just it's just a timeline and the, as technology progresses the capital costs get lower it becomes more economic okay thanks for that has any similar analysis been done by yourselves or anyone else uh doing the same kind of analysis where you're comparing the alkaline versus the pen in this kind of uh, scenario I think there's a lot. There's a particular lot of research going on in um, in the offshore wind sector. I think they're they're sort of they're, they're looking very hard at what technologies uh, are needed. Into, and I, th I think it's also important to recognise solid oxide fuel, um, electrolyzers as well um, as, a, as, a, as a technology of the future. And effectively, it's working out um, the benefits that these technologies bring. So, for example, PEM electrolyzers can ramp a lot more easily than alkaline, but alkaline are further down the cost curve. So. It's a bit of a cop out, but it's, it's again going to be an, a, a case by case basis. And I think, for example, the report I just showed or I've referenced throughout this, um, which has recently been announced, the offshore wind industry catapults report did some analysis looking at these different technologies. Um, and we can see that it's going to take, again, a blend of these technologies to to deliver this local, this renewable in the future. Um, it's certainly not one technology suits all cases. OK, thanks. Another question is, what are the primary and secondary engineering challenges that you are addressing with this uh, gigawatt electrolyzer design? So the primary, I, I assume that's just for the stack, uh, or I was, I was given an answer for the stack and the overall system. So for the stack itself, it's about scaling up the stack technology. So we're going from um, 800 kilograms a day to 2.1 tons per day for the system. So it needs, it needs you to design a whole new um, casing for the system, increase number of stacks, increase sizing, and so you've got all this ongoing design work um, that ITM Power are doing um, to develop this new technology. And then the secondary work really is partly the something else made in manufacturing, but I think looking more widely, the benefit of electrolyzer technology is that it, it's scalable, but many other technologies aren't. So if you look at your um, electro electrical conversion equipment, for example, um, you need to make sure that you invest now. You don't want to, for example, deploy, if you're deploying a 20 megawatt electrolyzer that's going to ramp up to 100, you don't want to deploy 20 megawatts of rectifiers and then try and go to 100 because it just doesn't work. So you need to think about those scaling technologies as well um, and, and all the balance of plant, really. So I think the challenges that are being addressed in the feed uh, and looking at how to invest in, and the strategy for doing so, um, but I think that's, those are probably you know, two of the good examples. Okay. Well, another question is, uh, perhaps a somewhat difficult one, is um, a, a comment from a question from somebody on the floor saying that they've heard about um, some Chinese electrolyzer manufacturers claiming that they can do $200 per kilowatt. Um, now, of course, we don't know whether we're, they're just talking about stack level or system level or, or fully installed. Um, do you have any view or comments on that? I've certainly heard it as well. Um, I think it's a, it's a healthy note you made there that we don't know if it's stack or system level. Um, I th and the, the, the reality is though, is that China is, is technology. So, you know, we see that across the supply chain, you know, the, you, in Europe, we're talking about a thousand bus project, for example, an H2 bus Europe. In China, they're talking about thousands and thousands, you know, 20,000 buses. So it's a, just a different scale. And if anything, it, it demonstrates that if we accelerate these activities and we invest in, in well, UK, but also European um, manufacturing capabilities for these technologies, we can, we can match those costs in the future. And effectively by 2050, where, the, where this economy is at scale, there's no reason we can't be at the same cost, but we don't necessarily want to be caught out against these um, other low cost options. And we need to make sure that um, we, we support UK industry 
in in getting in producing these uh, systems which are competitive at, at, at a global level. Um, so it's it's certainly foreseeable in the future that we get to these low costs, uh, and it's important that we maintain our competitivity in doing so. Okay, maybe just to finish this off, as uh, we're just about out of time now, is I guess there is a limit you can get to with the cost, because obviously you can't go below the fundamental material costs in building your system, unless of course you're heavily subsidised by your government. So, do you um, is that analysis has been done as to ultimately what could be, you know, the, that asymptotic limit at the lowest possible cost? assuming it costs nothing to manufacture, you know, what are the material costs for electrolyzer systems, PEM and alkaline and solid oxide? Yeah, I, I think, you know, we're seeing, I mean, if I scroll back to it, um, I mean, we're seeing these, you know, the mid 2020s is where we're seeing the largest cost reductions, both in terms of the system cost and in terms of the general cost of hydrogen. So it certainly will be asymptotic and we're starting to see that already. And I think the, the intent is that with these new technologies, you know, there's, they always seem to beat the cost curves uh, and this sort of thing. But, you know, the, the sort of level you're seeing in China where you get to um, your significant levels of manufacturing production, that's sort of indicative, I think, of that asymptot asymptotic cost point. So your 200 euros per, or 200 pounds, whatever it is, per kilowatt level, that mark is seems to be the at the market at scale um, uh, point. Now, you know, there are always new technologies that are coming and there are new technology developments. So for example, reducing your platinum costs um, by, by um, chemical vapor deposition or things like this, where you can, you can reduce the amount of material you use uh, become important, but that's the, obviously there is a limit. Um, and then it will be looking at, for example, what the next technology is. So for example, solid oxide um, electrolyzer systems and, and this sort of thing, and what benefits they can bring on top of this. And it might then be a question of improvements in efficiency over reductions in cost. Great. Well, thanks for that. So I guess the message there is we should perhaps take uh, take with a little bit of a pinch of salt numbers that are quoted if they are if they are at or below what the actual materials costs are. So thanks very much, Matt. So we will pass on Hello. now to um, our next speakers. So for this, uh, we have a whole session now on Project Dolphin. So this is developing green hydrogen from uh, the floating off wind platforms. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers. We have three speakers. Um, we have David Kane from ERM, Chris Lomax from ODE, and also David Robertson, uh, head of renewables ODE will join in as well. So we will uh, follow um, straight on from David Kane's ERM presentation. We'll follow on straight away with Chris Lomax. And then after the end of those two presentations, we'll have a QA &A panel session. And then we'll aim to wrap up uh, perhaps slightly before 11 o'clock so we can all have a short break. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to David Kane uh, for from ERM, principal consultant from the low carbon energy team at ERM. So David, if you could just give a very brief introduction. Uh, yourself when you start the presentation, and all likewise for Chris, uh, David as well, the other David. Um, if you can also give us brief introductions to yourselves before you start doing your part of the presentation. So thank you. Sure thing. Happy to. Um, just uh, share my screen. So with a bit of luck, that will come up for everyone to see. Can everyone? Uh, See my presentation then. Yes, thanks, Chris. <laughs> good, okay, that's great. Perfect, great. Okay, uh, well, thanks everyone and good morning. Um, so, my name is David Kane. I work for ERM. I'm a, a principal consultant uh, and also the, the project manager for Dolphin uh, during this current phase. So, ERM is a uh, sustainability consultancy. We're a global company uh, with about 5,000 employees um, and we're a sustainability consultancy in the broadest sense. We work on all sorts of low carbon um, and environmental safety type work. Uh, so we're supporting a number of hydrogen projects with things like environmental consenting and permitting, safety case development, as well as 
uh, as well as activities like uh, climate risk management in companies' portfolio. And the project that I'm going to talk about today is the Dolphin project, which is a little bit different for ERM. Um, it's a little bit of a step outside our comfort zone um, because we're acting as the, the project lead, which is not, not the role that we would typically take. Um, but we uh, believe in hydrogen. We have done for a number of years and, and we're keen that the, the sector gets going. And it's been really encouraging to see the way that um, the way that hydrogen has been picked up over the past year or so, or the past couple of years. Um, so the project has been running for a number of years. Uh, it's currently progressing under the hydrogen supply competition, which is funded by Bayes, um, and, it, and it has been under that, that uh, framework for the past 18 months or so. Working with ERM on the project, there's ODE, uh, and Chris and David are on the call, and it'd be good to hear, hear from those guys later on. They, they've been supporting the, uh, the Dolphin project for about 18 months now, so one of the first companies to start supporting us on the project. Uh, we're also working with Tractable Balanji um, as, as an engineering uh, service provider, as well as Principal Power as the uh, floating substructure uh, technical provider. And uh, Dusan Babcock and Nell Hydrogen have joined the team to look at the marinization of electrolyzers and support us with, with that piece of the work. We've also got Lloyd's Register as part of the team, acting as the um, independent verifier as well. So uh, it's a great team that we've got together, um, covering all sorts of different skills and backgrounds. Um, and it, it's really great to be working with, with such a, a mix of companies. So the Dolphin project itself uh, is a deep water floating uh, wind production of hydrogen system. Uh, so Dolphin for short, because that's all quite a mouthful. But the, the key parts of the concept are that it's, uh, it's floating, it's designed for deep water, uh, it's designed for large scale. Um, the deep water means that we can get to the best quality wind resources well out to sea. It's entirely off grid. Um, so the only connection back to shore is the hydrogen pipeline. So it's a dedicated hydrogen production facility. And the way that the system works is, uh, is it's, it's a modular unit with all of the hydrogen production technology equipment contained within the floating substructure. Uh, so you have seawater intake uh, running to a, an electrolyzer unit. Uh, the electrolyzer unit is, is uh, sorry, seawater intake running to a desalination unit and various other water treatment uh, facilities before the electrolyzer. Um, and then the electrolyzer unit is uh, is powered from the um, the wind turbine through a through a grid balancing system, and out of the back of the electrolyzer unit, you get uh, pure hydrogen and oxygen as a byproduct. Uh, the hydrogen is then stored uh, in a in a small storage tank before export through the the riser and export pipeline system. Um, and the whole the whole system is designed to be able to operate unmanned, operate remotely, um, including periods where there's perhaps low wind speed. So managing all of those, those kind of situations that you, you encounter during normal operations. So the potential for Dolphin, uh, as we see it, the long-term potential is all about the deep water, long distance offshore, very large scale production. Um, the, the base case that we've taken to look at that is, is 10 megawatt wind turbines, so the, the larger end of wind turbines that are available today. Although, to be honest, as technology develops, it's not, uh, it's not impossible to envisage 12 or even 15 megawatts or even perhaps larger in the future coming along, uh, and we're open to embracing that kind of technology. The technology scales very well, so the, the larger the the lower the costs come, uh, the, the lower the costs become. But we're looking at 10 megawatts as a base case in a, in a 20 by 20 array. So that's four gigawatt production. Um, and that kind of field size is enough to heat around one and a half million homes in the UK um, for zero carbon. And with the assets that we've got in the North Sea already, um, there's the opportunity to have multiple fields out in the North Sea, interconnected, sharing infrastructure, perhaps even repurposing oil and gas infrastructure as appropriate. Uh, and as, as the technology comes in um, and 
and is deployed in the North Sea, that kind of sort of handover, the passing of the baton from the North Sea oil and gas industry to a low carbon hydrogen industry um, fits really well with the Dolphin technology. There's a lot of overlaps in skills uh, and competencies required to operate the existing North Sea oil industry. They, they, they transfer very well to the offshore hydrogen industry with the Dolphin project. Um, and and it's, it also enables the infrastructure to be reused, as I said, so it's similar locations and similar um, skill sets and, and technologies and service providers that still support us with Dolphin. But that kind of vision of the four gigawatt field is a little, a little ways off. We've got a few steps to go through first. Um, so we're, we're, we're aiming to have that four gigawatt field um, operational from the late 2030s. Um, David, but, can I get, right, th thanks for uh, thanks for letting me know. Um, so yeah, so so like I was saying, the the um, the focus of our phase one work, so the, fo the focus of the work that we completed around a year ago, was to look at that four gigawatt production capacity. To say, you know, the question that we were really posing then was, does green hydrogen have a have a role in a zero carbon future or you know, what sort of price points can we get green hydrogen down to? Um, so, the, so the focus of that work was looking at that four gigawatt, very large scale array in the, in the mid to late 2030s um, to, to sort of, uh, you know, pose the question of, of what role hydrogen can, can play. And that, I think that question for us has been answered. It was answered during phase one um, to say that, yes, uh, you know, the dolphin uh, technology, the dolphin, um, project can deliver green hydrogen that's broadly cost competitive with current uh, gas prices through the gas grid at very large scale. Um, and I think that's reflected by general consensus over the past year or so as um, hydrogen has moved up the agenda in lots of um, companies, companies and countries around Europe. So the, the focus for us now has shifted into the into the, the how do we get there? The uh, those first projects that we bring in, um, which are not uh, as far along the cost curve, so they're, they're not going to be producing at that same low cost, um, but they are able to produce hydrogen. It will be zero carbon, and it will have uh, you know a cost point that's competitive in certain situations. So that's that's the focus of the work that we have at the moment, the, the Dolphin 800 unit. So that's a slightly smaller unit. It's a two megawatt turbine, um, and it's targeted to be operational from 2024. Uh, and and the project that we're in at the moment, phase two of the project, is developing that unit, um, which will still be able to produce uh, around 180 tons of hydrogen per year, um, which, which is. Um, it's not nothing, and it's it's important to enable um, the demand side, uh, sort of the users of hydrogen to also develop alongside the production of hydrogen. Following on from Dolphin 800 unit, we've got the first uh, sort of commercial scale unit, if you like, the Dolphin 4000 units. That's a, that's that's using the 10 megawatt turbine that I talked about before um, in the in the mid to late 2020s, and then in the early 2030s we'd have the First commercial scale farm uh, of around the 100 megawatt capacity. Uh, the reality of the uh, sort of 100 megawatt up to four gigawatt um, phase of the project, the reality of that is it, it's it's likely or, or there's the option for that to be the same facility. You simply start with 100 megawatts um, of production capacity with a pipeline back to shore, and then gradually build up the capacity of the field up to four gigawatts by the late 2030s. Uh, so, like I say, the project's currently in uh, in phase two, phase two A, which is looking at the the design of the Dolphin 800 unit, uh, as well as the um, site selection, consenting, uh, consenting piece, regulatory compliance, um, taking the design um, forward, uh, and uh, and progressing the design to the point where a final investment decision can be made. And, and we can look at procurement, as well as engaging uh, supply chains, talking to potential suppliers to make sure that they understand the project, the, the kind of um, activities that we want to be conducting in the future. 
Now, during phase 2A, we kicked this off at the start of the year uh, and uh, we've had uh, COVID. Uh, it's impacted the, the project in the middle of that. Um, but uh, I'm pleased to say that lots of our uh, company, in fact, all of the companies that we work with have been able to move their operations to, to working from home very effectively. Uh, and the project is still still progressing um, without any significant delays. So we're we're on track for phase two A to be finished um, in the middle of 2021. Uh, following on from phase two, phase three is the like I said, the development of the Dolphin 4000 unit, that being the, the, the 10 megawatt scale turbine. Um, and we would look to parallel track the design of, of that unit alongside the design of the Dolphin 800 unit. Um, you know, there's, there's a time pressure that's, that's on us um, in terms of delivering large scale green hydrogen quickly to enable us to meet the um, ambitious climate change targets. So uh, that kind of parallel tracking enables us to accelerate the development of, of green hydrogen. So with those first projects um, that come on shore, there's a, uh, you know, there's the, the modular nature of Dolphin enables it to be deployed just as a single unit or even, you know, pairs of units or, or, or small clusters of units and for green hydrogen to be supplied very early. And that, that green hydrogen can be supplied, uh, blended into the grid, it, it can be supplied into the grid, but it can also be used for um, fuel stations, uh, you know, for, for, um, for uh, road vehicles, uh, supplied to domestic residences through the grid, it can be used for, for train or bus stations, as well as industrial consumers um, or marine applications. Uh, but the project doesn't only bring the benefit of supplying green hydrogen to the uh, you know, to the, to the onshore community. It also provides opportunities for the onshore community to start supporting zero carbon energy projects. The early projects that we have have a, uh, a need for a supply chain, uh, a supply chain that has knowledge and experience of offshore operations, operations with hazard, hazardous chemicals, operations with renewable technology. Um, uh, so there's, there's all of the activities with developing equipment to uh, develop the project, but also with the operation of the equipment of itself. So really there's, there's the, these first step projects are about identifying uh, local communities that are looking to start moving towards low carbon technologies and Dolphin has a, a good role to play in, uh, you know, as a sort of a, a partner with the community, it, it develops alongside the onshore area um, that it's feeding into. And at the moment for the Dolphin 800 unit and the Dolphin 4000 unit, we're, we're looking at um, that being located uh, around Aberdeen and, and feeding into Aberdeen. Uh, there, there are a number of clusters across the UK that are, um, that are developing, but, but Aberdeen's one of one of those, and it's it's shown a strong leadership position, and, and we, we feel like we have a, a, a good symbiotic relationship with the, the the community there. Just a quick a quick word on the construction process then for Dolphin. So, following procurement of the long lead items, uh, you know, there's a few long lead items we have. It's the substructure, the turbine, the electrolyzer, um, but the the substructure can be constructed in a shipyard, and then um, you know, either either in in northern Spain, which is where a lot of the uh, sort of wind float Atlantic type projects have been um, constructed to date, or, or alternatively UK UK shipyards um, where we can develop the project at home. Uh, but after the substructure is developed, it can be um, floated to other ports for the installation of the uh, wind turbine, uh, and the the whole of the top side deck can be assembled um, dockside before being uh, lifted into position uh, and welded in place. Uh, all of the moorings and pipelines can be pre-installed. Uh, so you're, you're simply sailing, sailing up the completed unit um, for hookup and commissioning. Those images at the bottom show the kind of production line that you can have. Um, these images come from, from Principal Power, looking at the production line for their technology, but um, by including a, uh, you know, an extra stage in that manufacturing for topside production 
um, facilities, they can simply be, be lifted on and it, it fits neatly in with their um, mass manufacturing process. So I think that's probably about all I wanted to say on Dolphin. Um, it's a quick, quick slide there just to recap some of the key points. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just to say that, you know, it's a it's, it's green hydrogen uh, production. It's targeting very large scale. Uh, in the early days, we're looking to, we have a modular solution for enabling those first steps towards a zero carbon uh, product, uh, zero carbon technology and zero carbon hydrogen being produced for communities. Um, and uh, and, uh, and at large scale, it, it can support the, um, you know, a nationwide uh, zero carbon energy mixture. And there's some contact details there for anyone who wants to um, get in touch with the, the Dolphin project at connect underscore ERM Dolphin ERM.com. Thanks very much. I'll hand over to uh, Chris next, I think. Okay, so now we're Thanks, handing sir. over to Chris Lomax from ODE Energy. Thank you, Chris. Just a brief introduction to yourself. Okay, I just checked that I'm being heard okay. Good. Um, so I'm Chris Lomax. I'm ODE's Chief Process and Controls Engineer. And um, I um, have a history in ODE of um, getting jobs done um, and uh, Whereas David's uh, been talking about the uh, more commercial challenges and some of the, the wider challenges, I'm going to focus a little bit more on some of the, the engineering challenges we've been facing in uh, amalgamating the technologies together um, and bringing some reality into the Dolphin project in terms of actually getting it uh, deployed uh, in the future. Um, just a little bit about OD and our, and our, um, our background. OD is part of the Doris Group, which is a French company um with uh, global spread now we're unusual because we cover um both oil and gas traditional uh, offshore developments and also we have a long history now in offshore wind lots of involvement in projects for 20 years um deploying throughout the uk and increasingly overseas and increasingly into asia um our 50 years of experience in offshore projects um that uh, began with gravity-based structures. So back in the Stone Age, as I mentioned, we had the data turn to one of our employees who had been involved in that. Um, now that um, was uh, focused in the north of Scotland and uh, also, um, but just demonstrate some of the, uh, the length of uh, experience we have in the sector. Uh, more recently, um, our uh, solutions um, in design uh, stem from uh, traditional oil and gas developments, um, which are jacket-based structures, um, which is a big focus for OD, it's uh, part of our heritage. Um, so the solar line development in the west of Shetland there, toll mount development, which is soon to be deployed in the, uh, in the North Sea, and also uh, increasingly substation work for offshore wind farms. Um, so I think that's a greater Gabbard uh, offshore structure, uh, substation structure there. Um, but we don't just bring uh, design experience, OD is also uh, uh, an asset manager and we've been increasingly involved in uh, managing small assets in the North Sea and normally unmanned installations um, and our activities there are generally going out uh, on routine visits for maintenance purposes but also monitoring and running those facilities from onshore. So Dolphin seems a, a very good fit for us because the scale is uh, starting out small but getting bigger. That's what OD is hoping to do. And also um, with that experience of running assets in an unmanned uh, situation uh, in the North Sea and the challenges that brings both um, in terms of supply and maintenance. Um, we also have um, experience with pipelines and uh, work on interconnectors now, showing work on the terminals as well, where those pipelines come back to the shore. Um, for a traditional gas installation, the treatment required can be quite intensive, and before that gas is grid quality and goes into the grid, and I'm showing that back to uh, in the east of England, where OD and myself most recently, we were last year um, doing a job on the BBL interconnector pipeline to Holland. Um, 
and that was to turn the pipeline to reverse flow uh, mode of operation um, and the challenges that's involved in securing the quality of gas required for both the UK uh, and the Dutch sector. Um, so just to demonstrate that we have real world experience and that project's now successfully supplying gas in what is considered the reverse flow direction, it's actually from the UK grid over to the Dutch grid um, as we speak. Um, we have expertise across the project lifecycle, so that's uh, going from all phases to um, first conceptualizing uh, a project and going through the traditional oil and gas um, uh, project uh, lifecycle stages um, through a select, define, and execute an operational stage. Um, ODI is involved in all of those, and increasingly in uh, renewables as well. Um, we're involved particularly as, a, an, as an owner's engineer. Um, bringing our experience to bear on those um, on those particular developments. Um, my background is much more in the traditional uh, process engineering and gas sector. Dolphin has been a learning experience for me in terms of the offshore wind farm aspect. I've been relying a lot on my colleagues who have been involved in a lot of the uh, developments worldwide um, in some form or other, I, as I say, as owner's engineer or as a consultant um, or a construction consultant for the uh, developments which have been put in place in recent years. And quite a large number of those you can see there, increasingly in, uh, in Asia, as we said, focusing on Taiwan and a uh, new office just in Japan. Um, we're also involved in innovations in those sectors as well and pushing the boundaries. Um, I don't ever get to do normal projects. These are not, no run of the mill projects. They all have something really interesting about them. Uh, Dolphin is a case in point. Um, but we also have uh, technology within the group, such as uh, Doris's Narrowwind uh, Foundation um, uh, floating unit, which looks very similar to Dolphin, um, but has some, some specifics, um, which uh, the PPI um, floating foundation, which which Dolphin Space Center does not have. Um, we also have a mid-water um, technology as well, the articulated wind column, um, which we could also see a, a potential for a dolphin-like solution uh, on that technology foundation. So a little bit more about uh, dolphin. I don't been talking about. Um, so OD is part of the consortium, as you said. We're working very closely and collaboratively with ERM, and that's one of the successes um, so far of the Dolphin project, is that it's close collaboration. And so a little bit more about what's on the top side. Um, David mentioned briefly, um, we're taking seawater out of the, the North Sea, um, and we're desalinating it. Um, that's required to take you into the, uh, the electrolyzer unit itself, because there's a requirement for very pure um, uh, water um, to perform the electrolysis on. Um, the electrolyzers are very much based on onshore technology that we're packaging um, with the help of, of, as David said, NEL Doosan now, um, to make that offshore ready. And that's one of, the, one of the challenges of Dolphin is making everything that you see here suitable for deployment in a remote location offshore. And it's also going to be subject to that floating um, motion on the structure of Dolphin. Um, so again, pushing boundaries, because we only just had uh, power generation on floating units being demonstrated at scale. And the picture you see there is um, the wind float technology upon which Dolphin's based, that's PPI, um, and Angie's um, part of the um, expertise which they're bringing to the consortium. Um, and that's how you deployed in the Kincardine area, um, offshore Scotland. Now, from the electrolyzer, we're then having a small hydrogen storage um, capability on Dolphin for the prototype. It's not totally clear whether we'll need that for the long-term uh, large-scale uh, facilities that David is talking about, because the pipelines themselves, by that stage, will be quite good sources of uh, a reasonable amount of stored hydrogen. We also have standby power requirements. Now, the wind doesn't blow all the time, and we do have requirements to keep the station online um, in low power modes when we're not having power generated by the turbine itself. Um, because we've got fresh water on there, one of the challenges we've got is that it could potentially, in a really cold winter, freeze 
Um, so one of the things that we're thinking about there is how to manage that situation in uh, a remote, remote location. Um, the other challenges we see are related um, very heavily towards safety. Obviously, we're bringing a highly flammable gas onto a facility where you've got a large electrical power generator. And the uh, challenges there, even though they're somewhat um, removed from each other by, by virtue of having a large column, um, there are still risks which we've um, been looking at in terms of that situation. So some of the technology challenges which we've faced so far and, and hopefully overcoming. Um, the, there's generally questions asked uh, when we've been presenting on Dolphin is why are you exporting hydrogen? And the reason is we've been through a, um, a selection process in the earlier phases that David referred to. Um, and the Dolphin concept is the modular um, scheme which we've arrived at, where we're now exporting hydrogen in gaseous form from the platform itself, um, from the floating unit. Um, the other options are available, um, and others are looking at those. Um, where you could potentially see a fixed structure or a floating structure offshore, which you would centralize the hydrogen production, put all the stacks in one place. Um, that has benefits in shallow water, um, but as you saw some of these earlier slides, which I was showing you, um, there's jacket structures which um, OD traditionally developed. Those are good up to maybe 150 meters water depth, not really much more than that. You have a really big, tall steel structure the size of a skyscraper being deployed, um, and the structural stresses on that structure itself um, become a limit, and then you would move to a floating, uh, floating type of situation. Now, when we looked um, originally at the uh, concept level, the kind of size of floating structure that we would need um, for a four gigawatt wind farm, that's bigger than the, the scale of wind farms typically are being built today, uh, generally around one gigawatt for a world scale development um, today. Um, the size of uh, infrastructure is, is kind of tantamount to the largest LNG um, tankers uh, of, of FLNG uh, floating production facilities in place right now. And the, the step up um, to uh, technology, um, which that would involve, um, it, it doesn't seem feasible uh, as a good starting point for a start, as well as being as co cost prohibitive in terms of capex, um, putting all your eggs in one basket of the largest type of tanker um, doesn't seem reasonable as a place to start. Um, that said, those, those are may have benefits, but they, um, they don't also have um, the capability to store hydrogen uh, and have that as an energy vector um, in the pipeline. And that gives us a reasonably good um, potential um, to buffer the intermittency of the wind um, offshore. Now, we are going very far offshore um, in the projected, because a lot of the near shore the best sites, firstly, are going to be taken by traditional power generation by offshore wind farms by this point. Um, but also we're targeting the much higher wind resource, um, which would be available in further offshore locations. Um, and by, that, by virtue of that, we do get that potential for storage of hydrogen as the energy vector. Um, there are some costs which are, I'm going to they are available in, uh, in public uh, resources because this project is sponsored by Bayes. But just to say that our commercial target is um, targeting a very low hydrogen price for green hydrogen um, with the scale and the learning, the efficiencies which that larger scale unit will bring. Um, but for the prototype, we won't achieve that, um, but we have a, a pathway developed to show that it, it is achievable um, through learning and efficiencies as the unit scale and as the technology develops. Um, Again, uh, as David mentioned, we're targeting uh, offshore Aberdeen through a site selection process which we've uh, conducted uh, in the consortium. And uh, that's really bringing to bear ERM's uh, experience as well as ODs in terms of uh, environmental screening um, of the site. Um, obviously, we're adhering to the UK's offshore regulations and we're treating them um, in conjunction with our advice from the regulators uh, who we're in close contact with as a traditional oil and gas development, but also bringing 
in some of the, uh, the learnings from the offshore wind sector, um, because obviously this is a novel situation. Um, but the, the greater risk is the uh, final gas which we're producing on board. So we're very much following UK regulations as far as that's concerned. Uh, another repeat slide from uh, what David's already shown you about the, uh, the potential to uh, increase the scale in future, so I'll skirt through that one. Um, and I just mentioned the export pipeline itself and the potential users onshore. Um, our use um, onshore uh, is geared towards um, places, uh, as David had mentioned already, where they are already targeting green hydrogen um, as a, uh, an energy vector. Um, and one of the good things about the Aberdeen area is that the local council is very supportive um, of uh, developing uh, hydrogen fueling facilities, particularly for local bus fleets, um, and also for other local transport sectors as well. Close by, which potentially in the future, you could see hydrogen change running through. Um, a little now on the uh, process technology, it's my background um, as a process controls engineer. Um, we're taking seawater in, this is a basic block diagram. And what's surprising is how little by mass um, the hydrogen actually is in terms of the, uh, the balance um, uh, of uh, uh, what's going on, on on hydrogen. The hydrogen that we're producing is only 4% of, of what we're getting out of the seawater. Now, the other seawater that we need to use is for cooling on board. Um, obviously, the inefficiencies that we talk about when we discuss the technologies, um, that's inefficiency in terms of generating waste heat, um, both in the electrolyzer and in desalination. Um, so in desalination, we have considered a number of technologies there. And for our prototype, we're focusing on a reverse osmosis um, system. Um, although we have looked at thermal desalination, which may have some benefits in the future for a larger scale uh, system. And we have gone quite a long way down the line of developing that scheme as well, um, including the uh, liaisons with the uh, potential suppliers for that system as well for our scale up. Our electrolyzer is um, producing two megawatts of power at peak load. Um, so that's coupled with the power output from the wind turbine generator. And we do have some waste products um, being generated, but they're generally benign and will be dispersed and disposed to sea. So that's brine and backwash water from the desalination unit. And one of the challenges we have in uh, deploying what's an onshore technology, the electrolyzer, which is used to receiving nice clean towns water um, from the public supply, is that we're taking essentially um, biologically active seawater um, and having to clean that up to essentially drinking water or close to standards um, on our units. Um, in a remote situation. Now, it's not an unknown technology, it's the coupling together of all of those technologies of having them all running um, consistently um, over a period of time that Dolphin is, is geared towards demonstrating. So another enabler of Dolphin is the electrolyzer technology itself. I'm sure there's been a lot of focus over the past day and in, over, over the course of the conference on this. Um, the, the PEM electrolyzer technology is really an enabler for Dolphin. Um, the selection has been made because obviously it's, we're in an area with lots of water. Um, so, so PEM makes more sense than, uh, than any other um, type of electrolyzer technology, which may require more chemicals and supplying that remotely offshore um, is not really a great idea. Um, it would increase the inefficiencies and the operational costs. Now we can see that we've had recent developments in terms of the pressure of operation of the electrolyzer. And that gives us the potential to push the hydrogen off dolphin without the need for um, additional compression. Certainly in the case of the prototype unit, uh, we're targeting around 30 bar um, of export pressure from that demonstrator. And challenging that in future, there is an optimization uh, that it's foreseeable that you have higher pressure um, being generated in the electrolyzer itself without the need for further compression. That said, we've got a modular technology and we could deploy compression there. Maybe small scale electrochemical compression is an option in the future on board each Dolphin unit. So that Dolphin 800 unit itself, 
is um, a modular top size, which um, I'm shown there, that is um, largely containerized, um, but in the future, we could see that that's been much more integrated in terms of the technologies. And one of the benefits of Dolphin, may have been uh, mentioned briefly by David as well, is this modular um, type of system. Now, that itself gives us the ability um, to deploy in a, a, a scaling up number of units um, of varying output. So we can see great opportunity for Dolphin, not just in supplying the, the 100 megawatt um, scale up that David had talked about, or then the, uh, the 4 gigawatt large scale wind farm. This could also be used for islands where you've got a, an intermediate um, power demand, but also a need for energy storage. Um, where at the moment you're shipping in fuel oil or you're shipping in diesel to power, power a, a situation like that. Um, so some of the briefly technology challenges that we have in motion center sensitivity on the vessel. Obviously, we're, we're, we've got liquids being stored on there and the roll and pitch motions of a floating um, unit mean we have to intervene and we have to design around those um, variations that we'll see. Um, which is not unknown in, in industry, it's just bolting all of these technologies together. But also the electrolyzer itself, um, it's really looking at the efficiency of that operation when you've got rolling or pitching motion. And ultimately, is there going to be a, a limit to that motion where we have to cut off? That also applies to the uh, wind turbine generator itself. Now, the wind float one um, uh, demonstrator and also tilt of 13 degrees from the vertical before it um, cut out, uh, safely cut out as it was, it was meant to, um, in the uh, demonstration um, that they, they can do. Um, further technical challenges on the intermittent modes, um, which we see on, um, on Dolphin, and that's because we're not getting power from the wind turbine all the time. So we have things we've got to keep powered up. Um, so we have been looking at how we do, how we schedule our control scheme to cope with that situation. Again, in an unmanned situation, and we're trading off efficiency in hydrogen generation, um, the availability of the power from the turbine generator. Um, but we can again see real learning from the work we've done already, and some interesting developments integrating further the wind turbine um, powertrain with the electrolyzer in future. So where we've got a lot of boxes shown um, on the initial package, maybe in future, that will start to come together a bit more. So that's um, what I had to uh, discuss on uh, Dolphin. And I should mention that David Robinson uh, also though, will be joining the panel discussion in a moment. And he can introduce himself at that point. That's great. Thanks, Chris. Uh, yeah, just by way of introduction for myself, I'm David Roberts and I head up ODE's uh, global re renewables business. Um, pretty much heavily involved in all our project engineering and, and EPCI um, design projects worldwide. Um, one of the, the main focuses and, and part and parcel of me joining the uh, panel today is I've been heavily involved in offshore wind for the last 15 years um, and I guess over the last two or three years. And very heavily involved in the decarbonisation strategies for oil and gas and renewables, and the integration of uh, of, of both of these sectors. So, uh, very pleased to be joining today. So, thank you. So, uh, thank you very much, uh, David and David and Chris. Thank you for going all into all these details on the Dolphin project. It's uh, looked pretty exciting. So, we have a few questions from the floor. So, I suggest we take those and then. Perhaps if we have a short break, just uh, a bit before 11, uh, so we can all um, go and get a coffee or tea or whatever. So the um, so let's have a look at some of these questions. Just following on from what um, Chris had just said a few minutes ago, what sort of, um, you know, what are the downsides of um, having electrolyzers offshore? Um, obviously, you alluded to the fact that you really can only use PEM, but what other factors have you had to take into account uh, when siting on an offshore platform when you've got pit and roll and, you know, salt sea air, et cetera, et cetera? 
So um, you'll notice that in the uh, the uh, diagrams which I showed that the electrolyzer is sighted some distance above the sea surface level, and all of our pictures and graphics normally show a nice calm sea. Um, that's definitely not the case, certainly wasn't the case until on the west of Shetland, where we had up to 25 meters wave height to cope with. Now we're in a slightly more benign situation nearer to shore, um, and a little bit more sheltered in the Aberdeen prototype area. But when we are moving towards the further offshore areas, we will certainly see those high wave heights in storm situations. Now floating gives you some benefit there because you, you are floating on top of the surface, so you don't have to cope with tidal variations where a fixed structure would, um, but you do have splash. Um, being generated there. Um, the saliniferous environment, um, so material selection, protecting things from that. Um, air intake for units and keeping the, the electrolyzers uh, uh, seeing um, on the, you know, the outside of the components and so forth, and so they'll stop them corroding in, in that environment is another issue that we have to cope with. Um, and also offshore being distant from land, um, and thinking how you resupply um, anything which needs topping up on the electrolyzers um, or the ancillary plant, uh, typical kind of issues which you have to cope with. Okay. Uh, so, this is maybe well, a bit of a. Sorry, Peter, sorry, I was, I was going to say as well, I think, um, you know, the marinization elements of offshore structures in particular has, has, has been a challenge that I think we've, we've really focused on over the last 40 years in the North Sea. Um, Chris's team, you know, are heavily focused on, on, on looking at putting equipment offshore. Um, Chris's focus has been on pressure systems as well. So the operations and maintenance strategies are, are going to be heavily focused on um, for, this, uh, for this, this piece of equipment as well. Not to mention the fact that we've got the uh, uh, the wind turbine generation being installed offshore as well. I think the the, the fact that we've managed to marinise what was essentially an onshore wind turbine, um, you know, to, to to put offshore, you know, the industry's managed to do that over the years. I think the uh, the skill set certainly from uh, the oil and gas sector and the uh, the, the industry knowledge that they have marinisation um, of this equipment is certainly something that we have quite a lot of experience in. And that's something that we'll be looking to, uh, to obviously scale out across this project as well. Okay. So um, th there was a recent announcement last week concerning, I believe it was Microsoft had trialled, I believe in the waters of Scotland, locating a server in a sealed under underwater uh, pressure vessel uh, to take advantage of uh, cooling conditions, et cetera, et cetera. So maybe it's not such a weird and wacky step out idea to locate things below sea level. Is that something that's been taken into account? I, I could probably, um, I'll let you pick up this one first, Chris, then I'll, I'll, I'll give some of my, uh, my, my, my input for fire away, Chris. One of, one of the examples which I showed there was the solar land development, um, which I was uh, the lead process engineer on at the time, uh, about five years ago when we actually went live with that. Now that has a subsea oil storage tank um, as a, uh, as a uh, energy storage uh, device. And the challenges involved in, in putting something subsea are not to be discounted as well. You do, you do benefit from things being a little bit stiller in terms of currents down at the, uh, at the lower, lower depths as well. Um, you're not so impacted by wave motion. Um, but yeah, anything's possible. Um, I've done it before. Yeah, I, I think one of the uh, yeah, I, I saw the news reel on that as well. I think uh, uh, Peter, uh, I, I was I was really quite interested in it. But I think one of the uh, and th th this might seem about a, a bit out there, but certainly with the subsea experience that we have in the North Sea, um, you know, placing things on the seabed, offshore substations, subsea substations, um, you know, for high voltage equipment as well, is actually being looked at at the moment. So rather than having a you know a, an offshore structure with a with a topside and HV equipment, um, there are some discussions ongoing just now for uh, high voltage uh, um, substations being placed on the seabed as well, which I think is um, may seem a bit wacky, but you know I think anything's possible, um, you know, and I think it's, it's certainly something that, uh, that that I'll be watching with uh, with with keenness over the next uh, next few months and years. <laughs> Great. So another question from the floor regarding the storage of the product. So is the storage, um, you may need looking at compressed or liquefied storage. Is there, are you also looking at things like, for example, metal hydride or ammonia? 
for storage of the you know the product article. So, um, David, any, uh, anyone yeah, to address it? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll I'll go on that one. So for um uh for the dolphin project, no, it's it's gaseous hydrogen stored slightly under pressure. Um, there are uh, technologies for storing hydrogen um, beyond gaseous, liquefied hydrogen, ammonia, uh, liquid organic hydrogen carriers, all of those kind of things. Um, and they have pros and cons under different scenarios. One of the features of hydrogen is that it's transmitted by pipeline very effectively. So where we have, um, where uh, and one of the downsides to gaseous hydrogen is its volume. Uh, you know, it takes up a lot of uh, a lot of volume. So where you can have uh, dedicated production of large volume with supply by pipeline, um, that it, it, that is the most effective way of of transmitting it. Now, whether that's not possible um, because of distance or, um, or or small scales of supply or various other things, then there's there's a role for uh, ammonia or liquid hydrogen or things like that. But in this case, where we're looking at Bulk production of hydrogen. Um, it's all it's all gaseous hydrogen under pressure. Great, thanks. So what we'll do is we'll take one more question and then have a short break. So the with regards to thermal management of the electrolyzer stack package, I mean obviously you're you're moving a lot of current around and there's a fair bit of heat generated. What specific uh, measures have you had to take um, for the thermal management that might be different? if the, uh, the electrolyzer was based on shore? So the, the amount of energy that's being um, generated and, and effectively wasted in that inefficiency is no different than, than onshore. Um, really, we're looking at how we're exchanging that heat and where we're, we're discharging that, in, that, that inefficiency. Um, so in our case, we are lifting seawater and using that as the, the cooling exchange medium. Um, whereas onshore, you may find that in some of the containers that you see up and down the M1, for example, where, where we're using uh, hydrogen fuels as that done by, by, by local water supplies or to air. Now, we, we did consider looking at air and that may still be an option for Dolphin um, in terms of uh, rejecting that heat. Um, but air cools suffer um, more problems offshore uh, in terms of marinization. So it's something we want to look at um, in terms of what the, what's the best um, way to exchange that, that excess heat, um, mostly because of the, the salt laden environment. Um, Great. Does that answer the question? Yes, well, there's certainly a pretty big heat sink out there in the form of the ocean. So uh, no problems there. So thank you very much. Um, David Robertson, Chris Lomax, uh, David Jane, this uh, overview of this fascinating dolphin project. So we can all look forward to the day when the tourist boats will be visiting your project so, so we can see what's going on. So we'll we'll stay 500 break. meters away though by the, by the regulations. <laughs> <laughs> so let's take a short break. Um, uh, so I think six minutes till 11. So uh, just how we'll be giving his presentation at 11. So let's take a short five or six minute coffee and comfort break and read. So welcome back everyone. So Professor Joseph Howe, who is Executive Director at the Energy Research Institute, University of Chester. Joe will now give his presentation on taking advantage of the oil and gas infrastructure to produce clean hydrogen. So, Joe, if you can just give a brief introduction to yourself and then lead into your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Can you hear me okay? I hear you fine. That's great. Good, uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Joe Howe. Uh, as uh, Peter said, I head up energy research and innovation at Thornton Science Park, University of Chester. Uh, for those of you in the UK, you may know that uh, Cheshire is um, oh, about, about the middle of the country. Uh, there we have the second largest oil refinery in the UK called Stanlow. I work on what was Stanlow's former research and development facility when Shell run that oil refinery. Uh, and I'm head of research and innovation in that particular site. 
and I've been there now for the last five years. Externally, I do a number of different roles. I sit on the National Grid's Future of Gas program. I'm one of the uh, I'm the academic advisor on the stakeholder forum. Uh, that's National Grid stakeholder forum. I um, I also um, um, I'm very much involved in the education agenda and the skills agenda around decarbonisation. I, uh, I'm on the board of the Engineering Construction Industry Training Board, and I'm really driving the, the clean growth agenda at that particular level. Uh, locally within the region, I chair something called the Northwest Hydrogen Alliance, very much involved in, in the UK's decarbonised gas alliance. Uh, I've been sort of lobbying the, uh, the recently emerged uh, Hydrogen Advisory Council, and I've been engaged with the European Hydrogen uh, Council Initiative. So that's some background to me. In terms of today, what a fabulous day to be presenting this when hydrogen has been reported quite a lot in the media today, particularly the Times. If you look in the Times today, there's quite a lot in there about hydrogen today. And in particular, uh, the role of, of green and blue hydrogen and, and, and the agendas around that. And it's also such a topical thing today, colleagues, with the uh, comprehensive spending review and the deadline for the comprehensive spending review. And I imagine that there's quite a lot of submissions going in from different bodies and different parties and different interests across the UK today around the hydrogen agenda going into the comprehensive spending review. And then one last thing, of course, we're in the run up to the uh, sort of de determination of the off-gem Rio settlements, the price determinations around um, energy for the next five years. And again, I'm, I imagine that at the moment somewhere sat on this conference call, there'll be people that are deliberating and debating the position of hydrogen within that context for the next five years. So that's an introduction of some of the things that I'm doing. OK, here we go. Sli slide one. Um, this this slide really captures some of the uh, political and policy context of hydrogen at the moment. And it, it's really emerged over the last three years, I would say, since the publication of the of the industrial strategy. And colleagues, you'll be aware that within the industrial strategy, there were uh, four key themes that were identified. Now, if I remember correctly off the top of my head, uh, that there, there was one of them around uh, sort of information technology and the information revolution. There, there was one in there about mobility. There was one in there around aging society. And then there was a fourth one, which was principally concerned with uh, clean growth, green growth, clean growth. Uh, and that then translated it into the, uh, into the clean growth plan. Um, and within the clean growth plan, there's been a whole series of different things that have come out. The Faraday challenge associated with uh, energy storage, prospering from the energy revolution associated with uh, intelligent energy management systems. Uh, and then there's been this industrial clusters mission uh, aspect around trying to decarbonize the industrial clusters around the UK. And that's really cascaded into a number of different things. You've got the carbon capture and storage, carbon capture and utilisation agenda, and you've got the hydrogen agenda. And what, what I want to try and argue with you this morning, colleagues, is that the two are inextricable in terms of looking at the production of, uh, um, of hydrogen, of clean hydrogen. You really need to interrelate them quite a lot with existing industrial clusters and within those industrial clusters, uh, oil and gas infrastructure. So that's the central tenet of my work, and it's the central tenet of my contention and, uh, with you this morning. Next slide, please, Peter. So, colleagues, uh, I mentioned before that I chair this thing called the Northwest Hydrogen Alliance. So I'm going to make a little plug for that right now because this brings together some of the key industries that are engaged in the Northwest Industrial Cluster around the hydrogen agenda. So from this slide, you will see that we have hydrogen molecule producers, we have network operators, we have hydrogen consumers, people that use hydrogen as part of the manufacturing process. We have the engineering construction sector set up uh, uh, as part of this. We have the network operators, we have uh, some of the key transport operators in here, Alston, for instance. So, and we have uh, some of the local regulators, Holston Borough Council, responsible for you know planning applications and planning permissions. So, in, in this, we bring together many of the interests within the northwest, or at least around the Mersey cluster proposition, 
uh, for industrial decarbonisation. And we've really been advocating the hydrogen agenda now for the last three or four years. What is fascinating about this particular group, colleagues, and what's really interesting about today's event is, is of course, many of these are looking to utilise existing um, high, existing oil and gas infrastructure. Take you on to the next slide, please, Peter. So um, this is the area that really is the focus of much of the proposition around hydrogen and oil and gas infrastructure within the Northwest. So very briefly, if you look at this, you can see where I work on this on this slide. I work at a place called Thornton Science Park, which is virtually bottom middle of this, uh, just adjacent, as I said before, to Stanley Oil Refinery, Stanley Oil Refinery being the second largest oil refinery in the UK. To the to the west of me, uh, you will see uh, um, you will see Capenhurst, you'll see Yorenko. Uh, Yorenko are the largest uh, enricher of uh, uranium within within Europe, a key sort of piece of infrastructure there, not necessarily oil and gas, but of course it is fed by oil and gas. Uh, to the right hand side of me, you might be able to see a company called CF Fertilizers. They're the largest producer of ammonia based fertilizers in the UK. They consume approximately two to three percent of national grid gas yes two to three percent of national grid methane gets consumed there go a little bit further east and you you, you come to uh in Ineos and Inavern uh, and uh, the uh, energy from waste plants the energy from waste plant over at Runcorn that's the largest energy from waste plant in, in the whole of Europe you then come to Ineos Chlor uh, Chlor Vinyls now, if you've had a cup of tea or drunk some water this morning, if you're in the UK, then uh, out from the tap, inevitably that's been uh, purified with uh, with chlorine that's produced at that particular facility. Again, major producer of, of existing oil and gas infrastructure. And to the south of that, you've got the Rock Savage International proposition, which is beginning to develop a value proposition around the emerging hydrogen economy in the northwest. Just to the just to the south and west, uh, south and east of there, you come to Store Energy. It's not where it is on this map. I've put it there because that's a pipeline that goes down about five or six miles to a location called Northwich. Uh, Northwich, colleagues, is where the major salt caverns are in in the UK. Um, you again, if you've had any processed food today, you will have ate some of the salt that probably comes from there. Um, in there. There are two or three key uh, key uh, plants and facilities. The key one that I want to mention today in terms of oil and gas is that the largest onshore gas storage facility in the UK is located at Northwich. Uh, the land itself is uh, owned by Inavern and Ineos and, and it's operated by a company called Store Energy. Massive amounts of gas stored there, direct, uh, direct interface into the national grid gas flowing in and out of those caverns constantly dependent upon the price of gas at any one moment in any one time. Just to the, more, just to the north of me, you've got the Mersey Tidal, um, uh, you've got the River Mersey and the Mersey Tidal project at the moment is looking at putting in a tidal barrage and landing the power of that uh, onto the south of the uh, river uh, to drive electrolyzers somewhere in this particular area. Again, that that will be that will be green hydrogen rather than clean hydrogen. Green hydrogen, but of course that will use go into grid and will use existing uh, uh, oil and gas infrastructure facilities. Finally, on this slide, you will have seen the oil refinery. You will have seen CF fertilizers. There is a proposition that's emerging at the moment around the carbon capture of, the, of those particular those particular plants and inserting new hydrogen facilities, which I'll come on to. Peter, in my next slide, if I may. So here, what, what I'm arguing here is that in the locality, we've done an awful lot of things to, to begin to consider how we can utilize existing oil and gas infrastructure to promote the hydrogen agenda. Now, one of the central tenets to our argument, colleagues, is that net zero is not an option. It's the law. By 2050, the country has to be net zero and the government's challenging us with in other areas to actually accelerate that through the industrial clusters mission it's talking about there being a net zero cluster by 2040 
locally some of our uh, city regions particularly manchester is saying that by 2038 we will be net zero 2038 blimey at my age that just seems like tomorrow you know this this is coming along so, so swiftly at the moment now within our proposition colleagues you can see that we've been talking to a number of key companies and bringing these together around the hydrogen proposition we've been successful in a number of different um, government competitions around fuel switching around the uh, hydrogen supply program around the carbon capture utilization storage innovation program so we brought together all of the all of the different um, uh, all of the different knowledges that were generated through those particular programs brought together a fabulous array of different industries working interchangeably with with the local enterprise partnership and the various mayors in the in the area working with uh, the dnos particularly particularly cadence to develop this particular proposition around hydrogen utilizing existing infrastructure next slide please peter so what what have we done with this so uh, what we're arguing here in this particular slide is we believe that hydrogen right now is absolutely key in terms of the post-covid recovery and so you know as i said to you before i'm sure a number of colleagues on the line are very much involved in submissions to, to yesterday and today to the comprehensive spending review around utilizing hydrogen and other aspects uh, for uh, for the green recovery that Rishi Sunak has spoken about. You know, one of the things that drives me, what, colleagues, I'm an academic. I talk to my students. I've got a, a stack of 18 to 21 year olds that I'm lecturing constantly and they're challenging me about COVID, really serious joke. Yeah, we recognise the pandemic. It, it's it, it's tortuous. It's a tortuous time at the moment. But look at the impact of that of, of COVID upon society, upon the economy, etc. Now, Joe, last year when you were teaching us, you were telling us about the United Nations and the, and and climate change, and you were telling us that at the moment carbon emissions have reached one point uh, uh, have. Um, have uh, resulted in a 1.2 degrees increase in temperature. But you're also telling me that our climate change committee, committee and uh, you, the United Nations are telling us that we're going to reach this tipping point at one and a half degrees. Joe, that's happening in 2030. That's going to have a much more significant impact than the global impact than the global pandemic at the moment. What are we doing about it? And hydrogen, carbon capture and storage, carbon capture and utilisation is a key component in all of this. Don't forget that. And I think that's a really important message to get across in terms of, of debates and deliberations as part of the uh, post-COVID recovery and response, which hopefully are going into the corporate, uh, the comprehensive spending review submissions right now. Next slide, please, Peter. So this is where I this again is, a, is this is a more of, a, a, of an image of again of the of the location which I in which I work. And this is the high net proposition. So you will see on this particular slide how we're suggesting about hydrogen moving into heating, moving into transport, uh, moving into dispatchable power and a whole series and, and into energy as well, into industry as well. And we're going to have hydrogen production facilities around the methane reforming agenda, virtually on top of where I work, uh, which is interesting. Uh, you'll see from that the proposition around the carbon capture facility, taking the carbon from that particular methane reforming facility, linking it into some of the uh, some of the other large industries in the area, which I showed you before on 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 the on the map. Uh, linking it into mostly existing infrastructure into the East Irish Sea and uh, the uh, field in the East Irish Sea called Hamilton, which is reaching uh, the end of its uh, lifespan. You'll then see on this slide other uh, black pipes going out to various locations. So just to the southeast of the hydrogen production facility, again on this, you can see where the salt cabins are. You can see a hydrogen pipeline there going over to uh, the uh, Manchester city region, over towards Birkenhead. You can also see the hydrogen trains which are being developed in the, or potentially being developed in the area, Alstom. Alstom is based in Runcorn, which is on this map, and they've got a fabulous proposition around the breeze, 
um, which could well be built or maybe uh, some of the existing diesel stock could be refurbished at that particular facility. We've also got a, uh, an emerging uh, proposition through the Office for Low Emission Vehicles. Funding has been secured to, to uh, develop a refueling station for buses in the St. Helens area. So there's a lot going on in the hydrogen space around the decarbonisation of heating, transport industry, et cetera, uh, around this particular proposition using existing pipelines and existing infrastructure. Yeah. So that's one of the key messages here. And it ch chimes in quite nicely with um, with the with, with, with the with the theme of this particular session this morning. Next slide, please, Peter. This is from the Oil and Gas Authority and, and, and colleagues. What I want to do here is try to demonstrate that what we've got locally is then being also proposed nationally as well across different sort of locations. So here you can see the Mersey proposition. If you move up a little bit north, you come to Cumbria and you've got propositions up there around the wind turbine and the nuclear agenda for, uh, for hydrogen. Again, National Grid goes into Cumbria uh, on, on both the gas and the electric side. So there's op opportunities there to inject into the grid or use other infrastructure. You can then go up to Scotland, uh, Nexus um, being led by Pale Blue. They've got an absolutely amazing proposition around hydrogen and carbon capture and storage. Uh, probably up there with our proposition in the Northwest in terms of what it can do and what it can provide into the area. You're moving south then into the Teesside uh, area, further south into the Humberside area. And what you're seeing here time after time after time is propositions around hydrogen, industrial decarbonisation, utilising existing oil and gas infrastructure to drive the clean growth agenda across the UK. Peter, next slide, please. So uh, I'm going to I'm going to begin to come to an end here, but there's a couple of other issues that I'm going to talk about as well. On this slide, what I do is uh, show you my cluster again. I'll show you the Northwest cluster. And what I wanted to articulate on this particular uh, slide really is the export opportunities. So in my little area here, yeah, I've got quite a lot of emissions, maybe 5% of car, uh, of uh, of energy consumed in the local area, quite a lot of emissions in, in, in the area as well. Um, over on the right hand side, you can see a blue egg um, on not a lot of the world in comparison with the rest of the world that's on there, but uh, colleagues, half the world's population lives there. And what I want to argue here, colleagues, is that if we get the hydrogen opportunity off the ground in the UK, if we get the industrial decarbonisation agenda off the ground in the UK and we decarbonise one of our clusters within the next 10 years, let's say, and I think we could do, do something within the next 10 years, the rest of the world is going to be looking at the, UK, at the UK about this. It's going to be looking at the UK in terms of the technologies and the infrastructure. It's going to be looking at the UK in terms of the innovation agenda. It's going to be looking at the UK in terms of the skills and supply chain agenda. You know, who's going to build this in infrastructure, colleagues? It's going to be the engineering construction industry. And the engineering construction industry, well, we're world leading within the UK. We have a long history of doing engineering construction in the UK. And one of the things you know, I'm particular, pa particularly passionate about is utilising our existing infrastructure. We've got the skills set in place within the UK around the engineering construction sector, which has been building it, um, decommissioning it, repurposing it for the last 30, 40, 50, 60 years. We've got the opportunity to reutilise our offshore facilities and our offshore plants. And we've got the opportunity to begin to export these technologies and skills to the rest of the world. Uh, Peter, I'm going to leave it there because I want colleagues to have plenty of time to ask questions. Thank you very much, Joe. So uh, we'll start off with the question from the floor. The um, Has the high net project considered utilising residue streams from Stanlow? to make blue hydrogen rather than just using natural gas only. Sorry, can you say that again? The question is about Stanlow and residues of... Yes. Has, has the high net project considered utilising residue streams from Stanlow 
for making blue hydrogen rather than just using natural gas? Um, so, certainly the hydrogen produ production at the moment on, on, uh, on the Stanley oil refinery is utilised as part of the manufacturing process therein. Inevitably, Stanlow are going to play a significant role in, in the whole of the high net proposition. Um, and that is all going to be integrated, I would have thought, into the whole value proposition moving forward. Clearly, at the moment, there are probably some commercial sensitivities around the proposition as it's being developed. Uh, and I'd probably, Peter, to be honest with you, not go into those particular details right now. Maybe come back to me in a fortnight after the propositions have gone into the into uh, UKRI around this, and then perhaps I can talk about that a little bit further. Then, okay. So, what are the what are the practicalities and the logistics if you're changing over, for example, the salt caverns, um, which currently is a natural gas storage, and if you want to repurpose those to use them for hydrogen, because obviously hydrogen does tend to leak a bit more. So what are the, what are the practicalities of, of repurposing these existing facilities for use with hydrogen? Uh, the, the repurposing of the existing facilities at um, Northwich, those gas cabins could be repurposed. Needless to say, there's an awful lot of salt there. So I believe at the moment the proposition would be to uh, develop new cabins but use the existing infrastructure that's already on those particular on that particular site in terms of the pipelines and in terms of the pumping into the national grid or into the dno or the supplying in direct supply into some of the industries in the in the local area so that that would be what i would suggest to, to do at the moment because they're going to have to continue to uh, to extract that salt to feed into the industries in the area anyway, be, be it tartic chemicals, be it innovant, or, or, or be it just you and I consuming that salt on the table or throwing it onto uh, onto icy onto icy roads in the winter. So that extraction is going to continue. So why not continue to develop those uh, those caverns? So what what would the if you think of that in terms of an initial upfront capex cost of developing a new cavern? You know what we obviously need to take that into account for if we're going to use it for hydrogen storage so have any estimates been made uh, some work has been done on that it is available for colleagues to look at i can't tell you the precise figures off the top, top of my head but uh, some work has been done on that so if you look at the bay's hydrogen supply competition there is some material that is available on the website i believe around that uh, that that dimension uh, and I believe the name of the project, ooh, it may well have been called High Store, H-Y-S-T-O-R-E. So that's for other colleagues on the, on the call to have a look at. Okay. Is there, what are the specific requirements for hydrogen versus ammonia in regard to if you're making one of these, a, a new cabin for hydrogen, taking into account, you know, the, the very, very high permeability of hydrogen and, and what sorts of pressures you could store it at. <laughs> Again, a, a lot of the material on the science is available on that report. If you have a look on the Bayes website, ammonia is not covered into that report, but I'm glad that you've raised the issue of ammonia because I did mention that at CF Fertilizers, we do have the uh, largest manufacturer of ammonia-based fertilizers in the UK. And I'm pretty passionate about the ammonia agenda per se as being a potential carrier of hydrogen. Uh, it's certainly a huge consumer of hydrogen. It could potentially be a major carrier of hydrogen. It could also be a major fuel in terms of uh, transport and uh, ships, et cetera, et cetera, and a major way to export hydrogen as well. There are propositions emerging out of Australia, Japan, and Korea about the whole hydrogen agenda. So I, I think there is work, further work to be done in the UK, and I'd like to see the UK do much more work about around the opportunities afforded by hydrogen. I'm really pleased with uh, a facility that's been developed down at SDFC in Harwell around the green hydrogen, around the green ammonia agenda. Uh, and certainly I'd love to see more funding going into that to, to bring that along in terms of the commercialization of, of green ammonia into the future. Yara, Yara in the UK are also doing work around the green ammonia agenda. And I think NG are beginning to engage with that as well. So th th this relationship between hydrogen uh, and ammonia 
very often it's either seen as an either or situation, Peter. But I actually think that, to be honest with you, it's a bit of a continuum between the two. And I think that there is a pressing need for us to do much work unpacking that unpacking that, um, that, that, that sort of agenda between these two and, and actually looking for the commercial opportunities around that, that particular agenda. And, and hopefully uh, get, get it, securing more funding out of Bayes and UKRI to develop that proposition. And that could be done through things like the off-gem agreements, through competitions that Bayes may run, um, uh, and, and through the, the comprehensive spending review right now. I'm sure people on the call will be engaged in all three of those, both around hydrogen, ammonia, and maybe around the two. Okay, thanks for that. It sounds like you were um, starting to do my presentation for me that's on at 12.30. Sorry, Peter. <laughs> Which is all about green ammonia and hydrogen. Right. Okay, we, we have a couple of minutes left for the next session. So um, for our um, online audience, if you have any more questions, uh, please feel free to uh, send them in and uh, I'll put, put them to Joe. Or the, are any other any other segue comments you'd like to make, Joe? So, uh, Peter, I don't know whether or not my presentation will be circulated to colleagues online or if they've been able to see it in full screen. If they can, they will they will have seen my email address. Colleagues, by all means, do feel free to contact me. If you've got any further questions that you want to ask me uh, directly. Um, you know, this is what this is something I'm passionate about and that I've lived uh, through over the last four or five years. And Peter, one final thing. Uh, I've talked primarily about the utilisation of existing infrastructure around industrial clusters. There are a number of other initiatives, colleagues, that are coming up, which will, uh, in actual fact, be uh, an, op an opportune moment to engage hydrogen in, ex in existing infrastructure. So I would encourage people to look at the Industrial Energy Transformation Fund, which has recently been announced. I would also encourage uh, people to consider looking at the process industries network, which Bayes has also recently announced. So there's a number of things coming up. This seems to be uh, very important right now. Uh, so please consider that. Uh, two other things, sorry, Peter. There's a skills dimension in the engineering construction sector. Do engage on the skills agenda, particularly if you're, if you're a levy payer for uh, for, for apprenticeships and you're engaged with the higher T and degree level apprenticeships, I think that's a, a, a fabulous opportunity. And also you'll be aware that recently the government's commissioned the Hydrogen Advisory Council. Um, that's the, the information about who's on that, who's on that committee or, is all uh, available on the internet. Uh, every region I think has a representative so it may well be worth networking into that individual should you uh, should you have a proposition around utilizing existing infrastructure peter i keep going on uh, any more questions that you'd like me to answer no that's great so if you're happy to do so we will share your slides yes i am yes okay so we'll do that for you well thank you very much joe it was a very interesting um presentation we're Quite um, happy to hear how all of this existing infrastructure can be repurposed and reused. So we're ready to go now with our next speaker, Frank Vouters, uh, from, um, I should remember, shouldn't I? We spoke to this. <laughs> Frank Vouters. So Frank will be speaking about policy options for the European hydrogen strategy. So Frank, if you can just give a brief introduction for all of our participants today and then go into your presentation. Thank you, Frank. Over to you. Yes, thanks, Peter. Um, uh, indeed, uh, hydrogen is, um, as, as uh, Frans Timmermans calls it, the, the rock star of the energy transition. Uh, and I'm lucky to have been uh, able to focus on that for the last couple of years after having spent most of my 30 years of, of working life uh, on um, renewable energy, basically. And I, I strongly believe uh, that this is the next wave of, of the energy transition. Uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll do a deeper dive in, in, in that uh, later. Wadi is uh, the largest engineering company in, in energy. We're number one in chemicals also, and number two in mining uh, with a global presence. And uh, there's hardly a, a client or a, a sector that we work in where hydrogen is not a topic. So it's, it's hugely topical uh, and uh, very exciting. So with that, I would like to um, you know, start the presentation. And uh, today you'll hear a bit about uh, policy options for the European hydrogen strategy, because I think that is 
the hotspot. It's where, where it's all happening right now. Next slide, please. So you'll, uh, we'll start with the big picture, uh, then the role of hydrogen in the energy transition, uh, then a little bit about where, where Europe stands in terms of, uh, of strategy, and then lastly, uh, the main topic of, of today is policy options, the actual how-to uh, to make all this happen. Next, please. Sometimes, and uh, next, sometimes people still, uh, are still a little bit confused about, uh, about energy. Next uh, slide, please. Um, you know, whether we have enough and, and uh, you know, the density of, of hydrocarbons is so much bigger than uh, renewables, etc. But if, if you take a step back and look at, um, you know, the worldwide energy demand, uh, and, and this is the number, uh, and if you were to, well, obviously that wouldn't be the smart thing to do, if you were to cover everything uh, using solar panels, um, you would only need, um, you know, a tiny fraction actually of the Sahara Desert and, and, and a chunk out of Australia to cover the entire demand of, of, of the planet. Uh, and the same, obviously, for, for wind, um, you know, also there, the, uh, the, the, the potential is, is massive. Um, uh, Eric, I can't see the presentation right now, so I don't know where I am, uh, but if, if you can, can go to the next uh, slide, that would be helpful. Um, bear with us a moment. Um, okay. Eric is pulling your presentation up again. Okay, there you go. Yeah. Yep. Um, now, now let's let, let's focus on uh, on hydrogen and, and the role of hydrogen in the energy transition. Uh, next, I mean, this is uh, something that I guess by now everybody should uh, sh should know. I mean, there are seven main functions of hydrogen. Uh, in the future, it's an enabler for. Uh, more integration of variable renewables. It's, it's something that you can store loss-free over, over months and, and seasons. And then there is the four main uh, use cases in, in, in transport and in, uh, you know, industrial processes and buildings, but also as a feedstock. And, and lastly, and I think this is uh, something that is crucial, especially if you're looking at Europe, it's very cost-effective to transport hydrogen over long distances. It's much more uh, cost-effective than, uh, than electricity. Uh, next. And, and we've heard uh, already mention, mention of, of ammonia in the previous uh, talk, and it will be uh, addressed later, so we don't need to uh, do uh, a deep dive into this. But, you know, the, the question is also uh, hydrogen, uh, is that the best thing to, uh, you know, to produce somewhere and use it somewhere else? There is other ways to do that. Ammonia is, is certainly a factor that, um, you know, is, is extremely interesting. People are making very big investments in that right now. But also aviation, uh, jet fuel, very complex molecules that uh, uh, you know people are looking at that you can also make from uh, basically sunshine, wind, water, and and, and air. So uh, all, all of that is exciting. Next, so this is a picture that um, uh, we took uh, last year. We had um, you know the, the the pleasure of meeting with Executive Vice President, uh, uh, the guy with the beard, uh, Franz Timmermans, the European Commission. He's in charge of the Green Deal. Uh, and also now uh, the main man behind uh, the European hydrogen strategy. Uh, we we discuss some documents with him next. And it, uh, it, it but it's also uh, important to, to do a step a step back and and uh, think about the bigger picture because we get we get very excited when we um, when you're active in, in renewable energy and uh, you know you see the numbers going up. Uh, uh, you know renewables are are, are definitely in in the elevator. Uh, even large European countries such as Spain and, and Germany uh, are now uh, covering most of their electricity demand uh, with uh, green electricity. But we also have to realize that electricity at the moment is only 20, you know, roughly 20% of, of final energy demand and 80% is still largely uh, carbon based. It's coal, oil, gas and, and other things. Um, and, and even if we're massively expanding electricity, which is what we're doing, we're electrifying uh, Europe until 2050, um, electricity will probably end up uh, somewhere at 50% of final energy. And the main question is, what can uh, cover the other 50% uh, if we're serious about uh, the net zero carbon targets? Uh, we've seen uh, the European State of the Union address last week and the agreement to, uh, to do uh, decarbonization steps quicker and, and more aggressively. Um, so the question is, what, what is the, the other half beyond and, and next to electricity? Uh, next uh, slide. 
I'm, 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 I'm pretty sure you're not surprised that I would say a lot of that will be hydrogen. Uh, and, you know, that, that thinking, uh, if, if you're thinking about a system where half of your final energy demand is, is green electricity and then the other half is green molecules with uh, a strong position for green hydrogen, uh, you have to realize that um, for the electricity already, you need um, roughly 2,000 gigawatts of solar uh, and about 650 gigawatts of, of wind power. Uh, and, and then you've just covered half. If you then want to do uh, the other half with green molecules, for which you also need green electricity, you need to double that. And then, uh, you know, when you think that th through, uh, Europe is just very densely populated. The renewable energy potential is big, but to some extent limited. Uh, you, you cannot imagine that uh, all generated uh, on European territory. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, that realization led to us writing the manifesto where we also looked across the border. We looked at North Africa, massive potential. Uh, so we issued that, uh, um, you know, North Africa, Europe hydrogen manifesto. We communicated that with the European Commission. From that evolved uh, the two times 40 gigawatt um, uh, paper, which, you know, outlines um, uh, the next 10 years, what do we need to do to get there? And 40 gigawatts uh, seemed a feasible number, uh, aggressive but feasible in, inside Europe. But you know, given the importance of import also in the future, uh, we, we uh, you know, depicted a system where, whereby 40 gigawatts would be uh, installed in North Africa and, and the Ukraine. Uh, again, uh, communicated with the European Commission. We were very pleased to see that in, in the hydrogen strategy that was uh, released on the 8th of July, uh, the two times 40 gigawatts initiative was, was an integral part. So uh, it is now part of, of uh, European policy effort, uh, efforts. Um, very pleased to see that. Uh, next. And this is, um, you know, these are the headlines of, of the European hydrogen uh, strategy. Um, you know, there is recognition for all colors of hydrogen. There is a focus on green, but also recognition that without blue, it will be difficult to fill those pipes and, 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 and get there. Uh, there is also two targets, uh, if you will, one for 2024 and one for 2030. Six gigawatts immediately uh, by 2024 and 40 gigawatts inside Europe, plus an additional uh, 40 gigawatt from neighboring uh, regions by 2030. Uh, and, 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 and there is a parallel target for 1 million ton of, of hydrogen by 2024 and 10 million uh, by 2030. Nice round numbers. Um, and, and, but then if you do the max, 6 gigawatts won't give you 1 million tons. So you do need uh, blue hydrogen, you probably need biogenic hydrogen, uh, perhaps already some imports by 2024. Uh, and the same is valid for the 40 gigawatts. So you need really 80 gigawatts, and even that one gives you 10 million tons in 2030. Uh, so it's an interesting challenge. Um, obviously, massive amounts of money involved. Uh, you know, the bulk of that will go towards uh, renewable electricity. To you know, not not the, not the most uh, will go to the electrolyzer. It's a big part, but most of it will go to the cost of electricity uh, to make all of that work. Uh, next. Yeah, um, it's very rich in ambition, uh, the hydrogen uh, um, uh, policy, if you will, but very, very poor in policy detail. And, and that's just a reality. Uh, many things, it's new, many things need to be figured out. The role of the European member states vis-a-vis -vis the, the role of the European Commission, uh, who does what, you know, how do you harmonize that across borders? And um, that's what, um, you know, is basically the, the homework that people are doing right now. So right now there's, um, uh, you know, groups of people thinking this through how to make it work, how to, you know, f you know, do, do uh, you know, provide a framework for, um, for production of hydrogen, for the consumption of hydrogen, for the, the infrastructure, all of, the, all of those things. So uh, again, we, we got to work, we wrote um, uh, a policy paper that we've also now started discussing with the European Commission. And what I would like to do in the next two slides is give you a flavor of, of our thinking. And next slide, please. And these were some of the design principles that uh, we came up with. Um, first of all, a sense of urgency. This week, uh, I've been in a number of panels and everybody says, uh, okay, we have a lot of ambition uh, and we have no time to lose. Uh, not just uh, because of climate change and all kinds of other things, but um, you know, also the, the, the number of challenges that you, uh, that, that you have to, uh, you know, overcome. Uh, you, you can't waste time 
uh, too much thinking about it, debating that. So uh, there's a sense of urgency. Um, then I think it's important uh, to realize that you need a stimulation of supply uh, and demand, but they have they have different metrics. So the idea uh, that we were developing is that you similar, very similar to what we've done uh, with renewable electricity, uh, is, is that you provide a framework that guarantees, um, you know, if you will, a return for an investor. Uh, so you'll have uh, a mechanism uh, that gives a fixed, uh, uh, if you will, a feed-in tariff or a carbon contract for difference. Uh, the, those are some of the, 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 method, the methods to do that. But there is a framework whereby an investor in a hydrogen project uh, knows uh, what, what the return is going to be. Obviously, there's still technical, uh, you know, risks and, and some risks with the weather and, and, you know, some of those things, but they can be managed. Uh, but, but that has shown to be uh, the most effective uh, way uh, before things are commercial and don't need support anymore, like, uh, you know, what you have in the beginning. On the demand side, and this is where we've looked at how natural gas was introduced when uh, the, the Netherlands discovered the Groningen uh, gas field, um, they they also started looking at uh, you know what, what price are we going to sell the natural gas? So you're supplying natural gas to somebody that is now burning heavy fuel oil or, or coal, uh, etc. And and the model that they took then uh, was to basically come with a price point uh, that is roughly the same as the alternative. So you're supplying natural gas to an industrial offtaker that is now burning oil. You know that price level. Uh, is what you're going to match. Otherwise, you won't make the switch. In addition, of course, you can you can have some other measures such as obligations and, and what have you. But in terms of pricing, uh, that was the model taken, and I think that is a smart way uh, that we could we could do uh, for hydrogen. So if you're running a steel plant, I mean you're now using coking coal. If you know if you're going to switch to hydrogen, at least from a price level. Um, you know that should that should be competitive for you. Otherwise, you wouldn't make that switch. Uh, but coking coil, of, of course, is different in, in price than if you're replacing natural gas or if you're replacing, uh, you know, a, a transport fuel such as um, gasoline or diesel. Uh, so there is going to be a, a mixed, um, you know, arena of of pricing points because that is what you need to do to make people make that switch. Obviously, between the you know the, the, the higher feed-in tariff, higher than what you probably can get on the demand side, there is a price gap, uh, and and that is a subsidy. That subsidy will uh, will diminish uh, over time because hydrogen will become cheaper and cheaper the more we do it. Uh, but it's at the moment there is a price gap, and uh, the thinking that that we're proposing is to socialize that that. Um, uh, that, that subsidy gap uh, until it's not necessary any anymore. Basically, so you have uh, you, you you have a, you pool the price difference of all these projects, uh, and then you spread it out evenly over all the natural gas customers. And that's something that the Germans have very successfully championed uh, in the Renewable Energy Act. That um, uh, you know they they started in 2000 um, until it wasn't necessary anymore in 2017. So for seven years this worked. Uh, I think very, very efficiently. Uh, so, you know, basically the idea is to, to learn from, from different uh, transition mechanisms in, in the past. Now, last point on, on blending, because there's, um, you know, some discussion on, uh, you know, to get going, we can, we can blend hydrogen in, in the national uh, gas grid. Um, you know, we believe that is going to be limited in, in time because very soon it'll be competitive and you want pure hydrogen. Um, and, and also from a technical point of view, if you're going to blend, you're going to change the gas quality, you're going to change the product, uh, it's going to be different in price. Um, and, you know, what is it going to be? Is it going to be 2%, 5%, 10%? Um, you know, there's some, um, a lot of study work actually done in, in France. Uh, GRT Gas did a, a big study recently that said that up to 6%, um, you know, you have very few technical issues Although even at 6% blending of hydrogen and natural gas, you already uh, can't use, use it for CNG, uh, so compressed natural gas in, 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 in transport anymore. So, but, um, you know, we assume 6% is what, um, uh, what we think is, uh, is, is the maximum. Uh, and again, uh, you know, soon enough, you'll, you'll, want, you'll want pure hydrogen because that's where the bulk of the demand is going to be. Next. So this is um, a, a high level, 
um, you know, picture of, uh, you know, a policy framework that we're proposing. Uh, so we'll call it the Renewable Hydrogen Act, and it has two components. One that looks at the infrastructure uh, of, of things, and then the, the second uh, would be the Hydrogen Market uh, Act. Uh, and, and there is two time periods from 2020 to till 2035. Uh, and now I need to make my own screen a bit bigger to be able to tell you what I'm reading. Um, so, uh, as I said, uh, there is going to be limited blending up to 6% uh, in, in, in volume. Uh, but we also need to hurry up with um, you know, building a pan European hydrogen backbone uh, infrastructure. Uh, because that is in the end going to make the entire system more robust and, uh, and more cost effective. Uh, we have, you know, large potential for low cost renewable energy in, in, in the Iberian Peninsula in Spain and Portugal. Uh, but the bulk of the demand will probably be in Germany and other places. So uh, it, we need to connect that. And that is, uh, that is urgent because otherwise, uh, you know, we can't tap into that uh, low cost potential. Uh, but we're also working now on hydrogen valleys. That is a thing that uh, Europe has, uh, has championed. Uh, and, and also in those uh, hydrogen valleys, which are regional developments with production, um, transport and distribution of hydrogen and, and end users, um, we, um, uh, we can later uh, you know, connect them to the hydrogen backbone, but you won't have that backbone immediately. So you'll build the valleys, you know, help them uh, build the infrastructure, and later on you, you can connect that infrastructure. That can, by the way, um, you know, be both. It could be conversion of natural gas infrastructure uh, or uh, new built uh, dedicated hydrogen pipes. In terms of the market, uh, as I already said, uh, there, you know, the easiest way to stimulate hydrogen production uh, is, is providing certainty uh, on, uh, on the returns. Uh, through a fixed feed-in tariff, typically 20 years, or a carbon contract for difference, which gives you uh, the difference between the market price of what you're trying to uh, replace, uh, the price of carbon, there will still be a gap, and that could be a carbon contract for difference. All of those you can socialize, uh, and the difference between socializing and tax and spend is that it's just politically more robust, because the government doesn't have to pay for it. It's paid for by all the gas customers. Um, the uh, hydrogen demand, uh, as I already said, uh, will be stimulated by linking it to the price of the alternative, coking coal and steel plants, uh, natural gas and many industrial processes, etc. Uh, and, and there is one element uh, that is important, and that is a system of guarantees of origin. Um, and they, um, you know, they, they basically, uh, you know, describe and certify uh, the quality of the hydrogen. As, as we all know, there is various colors of hydrogen. Uh, you know, blue, uh, the, the capture rate, so the, the entire life cycle, carbon contact and content of hydrogen is the main currency in, in all of these things, because the, the, the ultimate goal is, is to, to assist decarbonization of our economy. Uh, so the life cycle, carbon uh, content uh, of, of the hydrogen, we need, to, we, we need to understand that so that it can become a tradable uh, commodity uh, and and beyond uh, so 2035 to 2050 is the last bit where we're, we're converting the uh, remaining natural gas infrastructure to to 100% hydrogen uh, system uh, we're going to have a market system that doesn't need the subsidy anymore because it is uh, at that point in time uh, the default option it's also cost effective um, and you know then also the guarantees of origin will enable you to buy the commodity but also you know, let, let's say I'm, I'm a customer in the Netherlands and I, I really want to support uh, my friends in Poland. I, I buy hydrogen uh, from Poland uh, using a certain technology that I like. Uh, and, and that's something that we've seen in the electricity market. Uh, there's all kinds of certificates that, uh, that enable uh, you to trade those kinds of qualities. And with that, uh, I'm at the end of my presentation. I'm happy to take uh, any, any questions. Great. Thank you very much, Frank. That was uh, a very interesting um, cover over the European strategy. So uh, we have some questions from the floor. Regarding the European strategy, um, who is going to fix and de-risk the returns from this? Can the, can the European strategy, as it's currently envisaged, um, can it work towards that end? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a very good question, and uh, at this point in time, not not entirely sure because I mean, if you 
uh, if you look at the past, the way uh, the de-risking of renewable energy investments uh, were done, that was a, a largely national affair. Uh, so Germany had the Renewable Energy Act, um, you know, with the same kind of pooling mechanism uh, that, that we're proposing for hydrogen, but others had a tax and spend um, a subsidy mechanism, and, and every member state did it um, uh, basically on their own. Uh, the question here is whether we will be able, and I think we should, uh, to think European uh, and have a European system um, of de-risking those kinds of uh, investments. So that would also mean that you would you would need very fast European uh, infrastructures. The hydrogen backbone is, is crucial for that. Um, but um, yeah, a European system of, of pooling, uh, you know, the, the surcharge for hydrogen that you need to make those investments, um, you know, paid for by all the gas customers. Um, you know, it, it would be new, but it would be um, yeah, it will, it will be the best thing to have in in the future. Thanks, Frank. Do you see subsidies for blue hydrogen as being counterintuitive, or do you see that as being an integral part of the transition? Well, I mean, um, I think there is recognition that, uh, and, and I, I showed this slide with uh, the uh, the numbers, the targets. Uh, so, if you want to have one million ton uh, of low carbon hydrogen in, in 2024, uh, and and six gigawatt of electrolysis, you, you need blue so th there's just no uh, no no discussion about that and blue won't happen uh, without a subsidy because it's just more expensive than gray so it, it, in in a way uh, that, that's that's a no brainer um, you know obviously over time uh, i think everybody agrees that you know green will become more competitive and it's also the more desirable option because it has really zero uh, carbon uh, and with blue, I mean, there's still a variety, you know, 60% capture rate and, and up to 90, 95, uh, but that still needs to be defined and you still have carbon. Um, but, you know, I, no doubt we need, we need blue. Has, with regard, you mentioned earlier on about uh, certificates, certificates of origin, purity and so Has anyone projected or attempted to put the manned landscape for the hydrogen of these different purity levels over the next say 10 15 20 year time scale yeah i think the i mean the the, the guarantees of origin that we're uh, describing um the, 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 there's not so much the purity of the hydrogen in that uh, as the carbon the life cycle carbon contact i i, I do think there you know needs to be uh, one uh, ideally very pure uh, hydrogen uh, quality that uh, you know is, is universal so you can use it in a fuel cell for mobility or in a, in a gas turbine for electricity or whatever um, so the guarantees of origin that people are thinking about right now they're more looking at the carbon footprint of the origination of the uh, of, of, of the hydrogen uh, and that's a quality that um, you know you can then trade and you know like we have certificates for electricity for many things that uh, you know sort of like a you know decoupling of a, of a certain quality to the physical quality of the molecule. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Okay, regarding sort of digging further into this, uh, obviously it's very important that these certificates, the people you know obviously believe that they're true. Um, how how much progress has been made to date in a legal framework for these and putting in place, you know, a robust structure for verifying that you know there's obviously it's 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 potentially an area that's ripe for fraud. So in terms of the legal framework and verification and enforcement. So how much progress is being made there? Yeah, that's yeah, that a very, very good point, very important uh, aspect that you're touching upon. Uh, I mean, the European uh, hydrogen strategy men mentions the Certify project, which is a project that looked at um, uh, uh, guarantees of origin for hydrogen. It does require more granularity. And, and as you rightly say, it does uh, require an international foolproof system uh, that you know you, you actually get what you're buying so that's the whole purpose obviously of, of the certificate so how, how to do that in a smart way i believe uh, you know we'd be stupid not to use things like blockchain etc uh, because the transaction cost can be quite substantial if you uh, you know uh, 
you know, the checks and the balances and, and, and ledgers and, and, and transparency and all of that, uh, you know, independently, third party accredited, accredited parties that do these things, that can be quite expensive. So, uh, you know, we have to do it in a smart way, but that obviously has to be solid. So, um, yeah, it's a good point, but I'm not sure that we're there yet. I think this is part of the homework that we're currently doing. Okay. Do you have a view on uh, what proportion of hydrogen could be derived from biogenic sources, uh, such as forestry waste or municipal solid waste? And, and what would that be classified? I mean, is, has anybody yet come up with a name or a classification for what might be called sort of negative CO2 hydrogen? Yeah, that uh, I mean, that, that again, that's a very, very good question. There's some reference uh, in uh, the methodology that's used in the Renewable Energy Directive, uh, you know, for, for biogenic sources of all of these things. So, um, you know, obviously it, it depends. It depends. Is it waste? Is it, um, uh, you know, what kind of uh, feedstock is it? So also there you need to look at the carbon footprint very, very carefully. Uh, and uh, but but I think uh, you know the closest to a solution for that would be found in the renewable energy directive, the recast of that, uh, which which will go live in uh, in in 2021. In terms of potential, uh, I, I think there is a, a thing to consider that um, you know we're probably not very used to thinking about. But when we are fully decarbonized, and that is not in the next 10 years, but uh, perhaps in the next 30 years, if we're not digging up hydrocarbons to the extent that we're doing that right now, then carbon actually becomes a, a scarce commodity uh, because where do you get it from? Uh, and, you know, if it doesn't, uh, if it's not recycled uh, carbon, um, you know, from something that you already have, uh, you know, then it, then it must be biogenic. Uh, and, and in that sense, uh, the value of carbon uh, is now very low, but it will, it will go up. So I think the last thing you're going to do is, is actually using carbon for energy. I mean, you won't burn carbon because you need the carbon molecules for you know plastics and, and, and all kinds of things that are higher value because it's going to be expensive it's going to be too expensive to burn so in that sense biogenic um, you know forms of energy I think we'll need to think about that very carefully what that is in in the future probably you need all the waste and you know biomass for other things than, than for energy great so um, so you see then the future then for in, in plastics and polymers uh, as coming from, for example, obviously with biogenic material, you get your source of maybe C6 carbons, celluloses, et cetera. Yep. And then maybe uh, if you want smaller building blocks, if you want your C1 hydrocarbons, perhaps you try to get that directly from CO2. Yep. Uh, from some other source. Yep. Well, thank you very much, uh, Frank. That was a a very entertaining and, and enlightening coverage of the European strategy, which was not at all boring, which <laughs> was certainly not we're, not, we're not used to that sort of thing from the EU. So thank you very much, Frank, for well, making it so interesting. Well. Thank you. Bye-bye. So now uh, was my pleasure to hand over to Nan Liu from Shell. Uh, Nan will be speaking on um, the Shell Blue Hydrogen Process. It's a technology to significantly lower the cost of large scale blue hydrogen production. And Nan is a technical expert at Shell. And Nan, if you could give us just a very brief introduction to yourself and then lead into your presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the introduction, Peter. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you great and I can see your presentation. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the session. Uh, my name is Nan Liu. I'm Licensing Technology Manager in Shell Catalyst and Technology. In my last 15 years time with Shell, I have worked uh, both in upstream and downstream assets and fulfilled several roles from project development to project execution, as well as plant operations. So in the oil and gas industry where I am in, and I'm sure most of you are in as well, and the transition imposed a huge challenge. So how to decarbonize our existing operations and how to make sure the product we produce is low in carbon intensity that can meet the future market demand. So in this presentation, I'm going to talk about how to turn those challenges into opportunities for our industry and how Shell Blue Hydrogen Process 
can provide a affordable low hydrogen products, which can help decarbonizing our industry. Yeah, so this is a cautionary notes. It's not readable, but what it basically says is, uh, yeah, don't buy shell shares based on what I'm going to talk about in this presentation. So the outline of the presentation, I'm going to start with the general challenges that uh, our industry is facing in energy transition, and then talk about why hydrogen is a solution and why blue hydrogen plays an important role. To meet the future hydrogen demand, the majority of the hydrogen capacity will be based on greenfield projects. So I will introduce the difference uh, in different hydrogen manufacturing technologies, and then discuss which technology is best suited for greenfield applications. I will then talk about the specific benefits of the shell blue hydrogen process in terms of the affordability, the maturity, and then give a few proof points. And finally, I will summarize the presentation with a few key takeaways. Yeah, so energy transition is coming with accelerated pace. And uh, a lot of the speakers today has already talked about uh, how to meet those challenges. I think to be specific, as oil and gas producers, how to, be, how to become low carbon or even net zero. And that's what Joe has already mentioned in his presentation, most importantly, how to, how to maximize the use of existing oil and gas based infrastructure. On the other side, as carbon intensive industry, how to reduce the CO2 footprint from our existing operations while maintaining a high energy efficiency. We think hydrogen is the solution. To meet Paris Agreement, the Shell Sky scenario predict that hydrogen will be a growing part of the future energy mix. And the Hydrogen Council predict that hydrogen demand will increase by tenfold by 2050. Hydrogen can be used to decarbonize the energy sectors, which are difficult to decarbonize otherwise, such as power industry, heavy transport, as well as uh, industrial energy use. The question is how to meet this large hydrogen demand in the future. So talk about supply of hydrogen, I'll briefly touch on the, the color definition. So we have gray hydrogen, which is hydrogen production from fossil fuel, mainly natural gas, where CO2 is all emitted to the air. And on the other spectrum, a lot of uh, the speakers today talk about green hydrogen, which is hydrogen produced uh, by electrolyze of water using uh, green electricity. So there's no CO2 emission from this process. So what I want to focus today is blue hydrogen, which means hydrogen is produced from fossil source. Well, the CO2 from the process is fully captured and utilized and stored either via CCS or EOR, enhanced oil recovery. So why are we focusing on blue? So if you compare the protection cost of green versus blue, the key advantage of blue is that it is currently two to three times cheaper than green hydrogen. And most importantly, it is commercially proven at large scale. Blue and green hydrogen share the same supply chain and the customer base. But the blue hydrogen production use mature technology, both technically and commercially proven at a large scale. Therefore, blue hydrogen presents a great opportunity for investors because it provides a low cost, low carbon hydrogen source, which minimizes the technical and commercial risk. So for some region, green hydrogen is still being produced. It's probably because uh, the reducing carbon emission is not yet on some region or company's agenda. So as we can see, at the CO2 price of around $25 to $35 per ton, blue hydrogen is already competitive against the gray, gray hydrogen. So it is all depends on what is the CO2 price scenario each company assumes in their investment case. So as such, we believe blue hydrogen plays an important role in any transition. So by now I have talked about uh, why hydrogen is an opportunity to decarbonize our industry. 
and why blue hydrogen plays an important role. So let's move into how to produce it. Today, the majority of the refinery hydrogen manufacturing unit are based on steam methane reformer SMR technology. If you have an SMR unit in your asset and are under pressure to decarbonize, Shell can offer both pre and post combustion C2 capture technology to help you decarbonize your existing assets. However, to meet the tenfold hydrogen demand by 2050, the majority of the new hydrogen capacity will be based on large scale greenfield applications. Therefore, the presentation today is focused on greenfield. So the big question is, is SMR still the best top technology? What are the alternatives? And how do we compare with each other in the blue hydrogen space? So talk about hydrogen manufacturing. There are three leading mature technologies. So from left to right, the steam methane reformer, SMR. It takes natural gas, react with steam through a reforming process. It is a catalytic process in a multi-tubular reactor. The heat to the process is provided by external firing at the low pressure side of the SMR reactor. The flue gas generate account for 40% of the CO2 emission. SMRs are cheap, for small scale and for gray hydrogen production. In the middle, you see autothermal reformer, ATR. It is similar as SMR in the sense that it is reacting gas with steam over a catalyst. But the heat is provided as direct heating using pure oxygen. Therefore, an air separation unit, ASU, is required. This comes as a cost but it minimized the large amount of low pressure flue gas, which makes the CO2 capture more cost effectively. So for large scale blue hydrogen production, this is more favorable than SMR. To the right, you see SGP, shell gas pox, which pox meaning partial oxidation. So it mix feedstock with oxygen and partially combust it. So similar as the ATR, SGP also use pure oxygen, which means the CO2 can be captured via a more cost-effective pre-combustion technologies. But the key difference compared to the reforming process is that it is non-catalytic. And also it does not require steam addition. The SGP reactor also operate at a much higher pressure than ATR which reduces the downstream equipment size and also saves power to compress the hydrogen product. For 500 tons per day hydrogen plant, the SGP compared to ATR can save up to $30 million per year of OPEX. As such, we believe SGP is the best blue hydrogen technology. So let's take a look what is the shells offer in this space. So let me give a quick introduction on shell blue hydrogen process, SBHP. Shell blue hydrogen process is hydrogen manufacturing using natural gas, utilizing shell gas pox technology for syngas manufacturing. And the CO2 is captured via pre-combustion shell a deep ultra CO2 capture technology. A shell blue hydrogen process, we offer a end-to-end -end lineup by integrating both shell in-house and third-party technologies. We're using shell's own experience and know-how from our own process to maximize the integration between each block. And we deliver an end product, hydrogen and CO2, at pressure on spec. Since shell is an owner and operator, for both SGP-based hydrogen plant, as well as CO2 capture and sequestration plant, we understand the true value of integrated schemes, and we're now including it into our scope of master licensor and offer it to the market. 
So how does the shell blue hydrogen process compare with the SMR and ATR based lineup? I have here a typical process lineup comparing between three technologies. I mean, a highlighter. So if you look the back end of the process, they're all very common. You need a CO shift block, a CO2 capture block via pre-combustion and a hydrogen purification block. So the key difference is in the front end, which is the thing as manufacturing part. So for blue hydrogen production, maximize the CO2 capture is very important. As we introduced earlier, the SMR still generate a large flue gas stream, which will require a rather expensive post-combustion CO2 capture technology. And for blue hydrogen, we are focusing therefore on a more oxygen-based technology being the ATR and SGP. So if you compare, both need oxygen, which means the ASU is required. But the majority of the CO2 can be captured all via the pre-combustion capture technology. If you compare the difference between the two process, the ATR still need a preheat to the feedstock, which generate a direct CO2 emission via the fired uh, uh, heater, whereas for SGP, it is not required. Furthermore, the autothermal reforming is a catalytic process. In order to meet the catalyst requirement, the feedstock need a pretreatment, whereas SGP is non-catalytic, so the feed pretreatment is not required. One of the key difference between the two process is also on the feedstock. So the ATR use steam as part of the reaction, whereas SGP, we do not need steam. Instead, high pressure steam is generated using the waste heat from the gasification reaction. And the high pressure steam can be used to satisfy the internal steam consumers, as well as generate some of the electricities to satisfy the electrical consumers in the block. So I have explained on a higher level what are the benefits of SGP-based lineup versus a SMR and ATR-based lineup for blue hydrogen production. So can we quantify those benefits? We have done a comparison of SGP with SMR and ATR technology respectively. And I will take you through in the key results in the next two slides. So here, we want to understand how does SMR-based technology with different degree of CO2 capture compare with SGP-based technology with the full CO2 capture. So from left to right, the first three columns are SMR-based technology with from no CO2 capture. So basically CO2 goes to the air and yeah, <clears throat> gray hydrogen is produced. With CO2 is all captured via a post-combustion CO2 capture technology. So here are the key findings. So on the first column, SMR is very common and considered as the cheapest hydrogen manufacturing technology. But as you can see from the graph, it is only true with a certain CO2 price. And in this uh, study, we assumed the $40 per ton. And then you can see the overall cost of gray hydrogen from SMR is already much higher than blue hydrogen via SGP technology. And if you add a post-combustion CO2 capture technology um, to the SMR, a above 90% of the CO2 capture can be achieved. But compared with SGP-based technology, both the CARPEX and OPEX are higher. So therefore, what we typically recommend to our own customer is that if you already have a SMR-based hydrogen plant and are looking for reduce the CO2 footprint, Shell can offer both 
free combustion uh, deep ultra technology as well as post combustion cancel of CO2 technology to help decarbonize the existing SMR unit. But if there is a greenfield application with new blue hydrogen facility, we will be more focusing on a cost, more cost effective SGP based blue hydrogen solutions. With uh, some of the customers we engage, ATR was highlighted as a preferred choice. Therefore, we have also compared with, with uh, our SGP technology with a ATR based technology. So the data we use here is based on public available data for a real project. And here are the key findings. So levelized cost of hydrogen is the key metrics to compare in those blue hydrogen projects. So overall, we found the levelized cost of hydrogen for our technology is 22% cheaper than this base case in this report. And it's mainly contributed by the 17% lower of CAPEX and 34% lower of OPEX. And for the 17% lower CAPEX, and that's mainly because we operate at the higher pressure, which leads to a smaller hydrogen compressor, smaller CO2 capture unit, as well as CO2 compressor. In addition, the overall simplicity of the process due to minimal feed gas per treatment gives CARPEX benefit as well. On the OPEX side, we are 34% lower. So besides the smaller compressor result in less compression duty, the key difference compared to the reforming technology is that we do not consume steam. Instead, high pressure steam we generated from the process is largely reduced the power import to the unit, hence give a significant uh, OPEX saving. So in the last bar, we also compare the natural gas consumption. So we are consuming 6% more natural gas in the reaction because the reaction is at a higher temperature than reformers. But we recover the reaction heat and use it to generate steam. So as you can see overall, that OPEX saving offset the additional natural gas cost. In addition, we have ideas to further optimize our lineup and to reduce the natural gas consumption. So overall, I believe our technology is very competitive in the blue hydrogen space. So in addition to the cost benefit, there are also other important benefits to consider. So let me highlight a few. First, on feed uh, flexibility. Because the process is non-catalytic, it is very robust against feed contaminants. Take a refinery fuel gas as an example. It contains sulfur, olefins, C2+. Plus. So FTP is very robust against this type of difficult feedstock. In addition, some of the natural gas field contains high, high amount of CO2. We have commercial reference in operating SGP unit up to 8% CO2 in the feed gas. So the removal of CO2 either in the feed gas or in the thin gas becomes an economical choice of the customer. Second item I want to highlight is the CO2 pressure. So in our Adip Ultra CO2 capture technology, we have implemented a intermediate flash in which 50% of the CO2 can be produced at a medium pressure, which significantly reduced the size of the CO2 compressor. And on the hydrogen purification step, we have chosen a methanation step. So the key advantage of methanation instead of PSA is that it does not result in any off-gas streams, which reduce the direct CO2 emission from the entire process. In addition, the off-gas streams is mainly hydrogen, which is the main product, but lost via the PSA off-gas. 
So by applying a methanation step, we can recover those hydrogens and therefore reduce the overall natural gas intake. But I hope by now you are convinced that the shell blue hydrogen process is a very competitive blue hydrogen manufacturing technology. So how about our technology maturity at the scale? So SDP is probably new to the blue hydrogen market, but the technology itself is more than 60 years old. Shell has a long history in developing gasification-based technology, beginning from our research in 1950s in Amsterdam. Today, we have over 30 active licensees, more than 100 units operating worldwide. So after 60 years of research and development, we have built extensive experience, both from operating our own plant as well as from our customers. For example, the Shell Pernis refinery in the Netherlands and the Pro GTL plant in Qatar. And we use our own operating experience to improve our technology as, as, as well as the overall operational efficiency. So over the years, we have developed new burners, large chain sizes. Let me, let me give two specific examples. The first one, Pro GTL plant in Qatar. The large single manufacturing capacity is required to get economical skill of GTL uh, products. We have 18 large SGP trains operating in Pro since 2011, and each has an equivalent hydrogen capacity of 500 tons per day of pure hydrogen. So to meet the world hydrogen demand by 2050, we believe the commercially demonstrated large train size is very important. So the second example is my favorite, Pernice refinery in the Netherlands. I was technologist there looking after the gasification based hydrogen plant, which is an essential part of the refinery complex. And the, high, uh, the CO2 produced from the hydrogen plant is at the high purity. And for more than 15 years, it has been transported to greenhouses to fast track the vegetable growth. Moving forward, the CO2 stream is planned to be sequestrated in an offshore empty gas field, which forms an important part of the POTOS CCS project near Rotterdam. After POTOS, the hydrogen we produce near Pernice is real blue. Shell is also a market leader in large-scale CCS project. Here is a list of CCS projects that Shell is involved. So without going into depths on the individual projects, there are a few points to highlight because CCS can enable multiple uh, value chains. For example, Quest project in Canada. So we are capturing CO2 from a hydrogen unit using a deep ultra technology producing low carbon hydrogen. And we have safely stored and captured more than 1 million tons per annum of CO2 since 2015. In that zero T site project, we are working together with our project partners on a large scale gas power plant with CCS facility. And in the Northern Light project, we are working with our partners to offer CO2 storage solutions to industrial emitters. Pernice and Gorgon demonstrated the role of CCS to reduce our own asset emission. So I'm approaching to the end of my story. Let me summarize uh, the presentation with a few key takeaways. So first, hydrogen will be part of the future energy mix and blue hydrogen plays an important role because it's low carbon, lower cost, and available at a large scale. Secondly, Shell has a competitive technology to offer in the blue hydrogen space. And our SBHP technology offers key advantage over competitors, especially on our, on our lower levelized cost, cost of hydrogen, lower CAPEX and OPEX, and the overall simplicity. Last but not the least, 
Shell has a long track record on large scale hygiene facility and is a market leader for CCS. So we can provide the expertise in developing an integrated hydrogen solution for you. Yeah, that's all what I want to talk about. So do you have any questions? Thank you very much, Nan, for the very interesting presentation covering these range of technologies and the advances that you've made uh, with the integrated process to develop blue hydrogen. So mm -hmm. we have a, a few questions. Yeah. Um, obviously, there's a significant amount of energy required for driving the air separation units in mm -hmm. these processes. So with the high pressure steam that you're generating, and the steam that's not used in the process, you generate electricity. So is that um, a surplus or a deficit in terms of how much electricity you need to drive your air separation unit? Yeah, yeah that's a very good question. And the, the, one of the main reasons why we are looking at integrated solution is to basically optimize the overall energy balance. So in short, the overall balance, we are still in deficit, so we still need to import electricity. So the priority that we are putting on the own steam generation is first to satisfy the steam, uh, uh, let's say, consumers within our own process. So we know the water gas shift reaction will require a large amount of steam. So as, as well as our ultra unit will need steam to regenerate the solvent. So we will first satisfy our internal steam consumers so we are not yeah, we do not require any steam import to our complex. And then the surplus of steam will be used to generate ele electricity for the power consumers. So the own electricity generation account for about 20% of the overall um, yeah, uh, energy import, electricity import. But in general, we still need to import. But the amount of importing electricity is significantly lower. And that's why you see this um, yeah, OPEC saving. So how much more headroom do you think there is in optimizing your process to uh, to try and minimize the importation of electricity? Um, how many more how many more percent uh, improvement do you think you can make? Compared to the the current uh, market practice or within our process, how much more can we still optimize? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I think in general, we're also looking with, uh, so we try to integrate as much as possible by including ASU, which is not a shell technology as well as the compression side. So I think the work that we need to do on each individual project is that how much of, we call it OSBL, um, for instance, type of utilities that is available on site. Mm -hmm. So I think today a lot of question is on yeah um, green green uh, hydrogen versus blue hydrogen. Yeah, I mean green hydrogen produce oxygen, and if we use oxygen based technology to produce blue hydrogen, I think yeah of course there is a skill difference, but there are synergies that we can combine when developing the entire hydrogen value chain in yeah, a clustered approach, and to see how do we make use of this we call it OSBL type of utilities and scopes and integrating in it into our yeah, current scope of supply. And then in that sense, I think we can further improve the energy efficiency. OK, um, just to clarify your points uh, on the cost comparison between blue hydrogen and gray hydrogen, mm -hmm. do the cost of the blue hydrogen include CO2 sequestration into underground res reservoirs? Or is it assumed that the CO2 is used above ground? In other words, when you draw an envelope around your process, uh, yeah. at what point is, is it the CO2 at the plant gate or is the CO2 already being sequestered? Yeah, yeah so in this uh, comparison, uh, the, the slides I showed on the SMR comparison, so we are co including the CO2 transportation and sequestration cost into the comparison because that's a fair comparison with, yeah, the, the cost of CO2 goes to the air. And of course, what I didn't show is there is a big sensitivity um, depends on where you are. So if you are in uh, Rotterdam and then the pipelines nearby and then there is a yeah reservoir available for, for um, uh, storing CO2. 
And if you have to ship CO2 to, to a remote location like Northern Light, and of course the, the transportation and sequestration cost is very different. So we are using a middle price, but yeah, I think that is a very good question in terms of how do you make use of the clustered approach and how to yeah position yourself in terms of what is the cheapest CO2 uh, sequestration cost versus blue hydrogen production cost. But uh, yeah, we have included that into our comparison. Okay, so just one final question. What, what do you normally quote or guarantee as your product hydrogen purity for your blue hydrogen process? Because mm -hmm. obviously you have a methanation step there. So uh, you, you must have a, um, yeah. a specification on your product purity. Right. Yeah. So I, I, I don't know how much time I have, but it's a very interesting question because we've been engaging with different uh, customers and um, the hydrogen purity requirement is a key, uh, let's say, factor to decide what type of hydrogen purification technology we, would, we will uh, include. So if you are going for mobility, looking for the four nice uh, yeah, hydrogen purity, then that's not achievable by methanation. So you, we, we will include a PSA option as well, and then utilize that off gas to generate steam. But most of the industrial users that we are speaking to, the power sector, or even blending the natural gas to the natural, uh, blending the hydrogen product into the natural gas grade, the purity uh, that generated from a methanation process is good enough for those for those customers. So the methanation is also used for our Pernis refinery where I worked. So yeah, it is a common practice, but in terms of a purity, that's very much depending on what type of natural gas quantity that, uh, yeah, quality that we are receiving as feed gas. So typically we say with methanation, we can uh, generate a hydrogen purity of 96 to 98%, depends on how much nitrogen you have in the feed gas. But that's why we believe the large scale hydrogen production that is available from blue and it meet very well with industrial consumers okay thank you very much nan so thank you again for your wonderful presentation on this uh, key technology in the transition to totally uh, zero um, net zero in 2050 so thank you nan so we'll now move on to the next presentation so just a um, brief introduction to myself. Um, you've obviously heard a lot of me the, the session on Tuesday and today as I've been moderating. So uh, my name is Dr. Peter Gray. I'm Business Development Director at Anatman Limited, which is a uh, in hydrogen, um, particularly mainly related to the use of hydrogen in decarbonation, decarbonisation in very large scale chemical industry, petrochemicals, et cetera. So what I want to talk about today is the use of ammonia in enabling a green hydrogen future. So this, this has been alluded to in some of the previous presentations. So I will go into this topic in a little bit more detail. So for the next slide, please, Eric. So if we look at um, the graph here, what we can see is that hydrogen, as we've you know listened to today and on Tuesday, hydrogen has a great future and is and necessary in the decarbonisation. But as with any new technology, there's some challenges to overcome with the technology. For example, if we look cost, um, a lot of the presentations have been regarding cost. The optimum is large scale. For example, as Nan was going to in some detail in the previous presentation. So here we're talking about large scale centralized production directly connected to renewables, uh, for example, wind or solar, or some kind of reformation process using carbon capture storage utilization. However, if we look at distribution, if we look at from an end user perspective, so it's all very well being able to produce the hydrogen at very low cost in a large centralized location, but you've got to get it to your end users. So here, the distribution. So the benefits of the large scale centralized production can be rapidly lost if the end user is at any kind of distance from production. And if we're talking about totally green hydrogen, so we're talking about the low cost renewables, then in general, 
the um, the location of the generation uh, or the production can be a long way from the user. For example, if we're talking about very low cost renewables in the Middle East or in Australia, that's obviously quite a long way from Europe. So you might be able to produce your green hydrogen very, very cheaply in those locations, but by the time you get it to the end user, um, you've added a lot of cost. So if we look at the two graphs, for example, just a comparison of some common ways of transporting energy in uh, either as uh, gasoline or hydrogen. So if we look at, uh, say, a 40 ton truck transportation of fuel in kilograms per truck of gasoline, obviously a lot of fuel, 25, 26,000 kilograms, 25, 26 tons. Gaseous hydrogen, if for example, if it's being transported in a tube trailer, well, that's way down there near the bottom. That's, you know, maybe 200, 300, 400, maybe up to 500 kilograms on a truck, depending on what kind of tube trailers used or composite tanks, the pressure of the hydrogen is at. If we look by the hydrogen, then uh, we can get more on a truck. If we look at the hydrogen content of um, ammonia, liquid ammonia, so here in the that uh, blue bar, the shaded blue bar at the bottom, what you can see there is that on a truck of that size, you can carry more hydrogen in ammonia than you can in liquid hydrogen. That's because the liquid, even with liquid hydrogen, hydrogen in liquefied form, the density is quite low um, relative to other liquids. Well, if you look at if you look at, it, at this in a different way, look at the graph on the right. If we convert this. Uh, weight of um, hydrogen or gasoline, you convert that into gigajoules per truck. Gasoline is obviously a very large number. But if we, the, the, if we move across to the right, so gaseous hydrogen, liquid hydrogen, ammonia. Ammonia, as you can see, is can carry something in the region of twice the amount of energy compared to even liquid hydrogen. So what we're talking about here is that ammonia is an enabler of an economically viable international hydrogen economy, simply because it helps to solve the low energy density problem that you have with gaseous hydrogen or even with liquid hydrogen. So next slide, please, Eric. We look at this in a bit more detail. Ammonia, if you look at the, the um, what elements are next to each other on the periodic table. Ammonia is simply just another analogue of water or methane. So water, you've got oxygen with two hydrogens. Ammonia, you've got nitrogen with three hydrogens. And methane, you've got carbon with four hydrogens. It was invented by uh, harbour in 1914, and the harbour Bosch process has been around for well, well over 100 years now. The conditions uh, need fairly high operating pressure because of Le Chatelier's principle, and temperatures not too high, moderate 450-500, and it uses an iron catalyst. So it's a relatively simple process that's been optimised over the last hundred years, and there's at least 180 million tonnes of ammonia produced this way per year. And the actual yield of hydrogen from this process is quite high. In other words, the amount of hydrogen in the product ammonia versus the hydrogen you put into the process, that total um, there is typically almost 100%, typically quoted to be, for example, 97% of the hydrogen that goes into the process comes out the other end in the ammonia molecule. So as an energy carrier, the hydrogen content of ammonia is very good. It's a very high hydrogen content on a weight basis, as we saw in the previous slide. It's very easily compressed to liquid form. You don't need much pressure to liquefy it or, um, or looking at it another way, you don't need to chill it very cold to keep it in liquid form. It's widely transported by road, rail, ship, pipeline, etc., for many, many decades. So that's all mature technology and infrastructure that already exists. 
and it can be easily stored and transported in equipment that's already used for LPG, for example. If you look at the picture on the bottom right there, there's a picture of the tanker, the Flanders Tenacity. That's a dual purpose tanker. It can carry either uh, LPG or ammonia in the same tanker. And that single ship can carry in the region of about 47,000 tonnes of ammonia, which uh, if you convert that to gigajoules, it's a lot. If you look, uh, the, for example, in the, in the table there, different molecules as hydrogen carriers, if you compare ammonia to gasoline or cyclohexane or methanol, it's, it has the highest content by weight of any of those. And more importantly, of course, is there is no carbon atom in the ammonia molecule. So you don't have that to worry about. So can we have the next slide, please, Eric? Thank you. If we look um, at domestic supply of hydrogen using ammonia as the carrier, then you, for example, we're talking about supplying, using ammonia to carry hydrogen for use, for example, in heating or in transportation. And there's some key um, factors here, some key benefits. Liquid hydrogen, Transportation of hydrogen as liquid hydrogen is cost-effective transport by road. However, unfortunately, this is more than offset by the capex and operating costs of liquefaction, which obviously need to be factored into the final cost of the liquid hydrogen. The liquid hydrogen plants are, you know, few and far between, and they're very expensive to run and to operate. There are no liquid hydrogen production, no large scale liquid hydrogen production facilities in the UK. So um, that's pretty much a non starter for the UK simply because you, you know, you would struggle to be able to justify the business case to anybody to invest in building, uh, building and operating a liquid hydrogen facility in the UK. As I mentioned on the previous slide, ammonia production is low cost and all optimized. So the 100 years of operation. It typically costs less than 30p per kilogram of hydrogen in the ammonia to produce that ammonia. And importantly, from a UK perspective, there are already three large world scale ammonia plants in the UK. Obviously, if you're transporting the hydrogen in the form of ammonia to your end use, it needs to be converted back to hydrogen again, hydrogen in a, an ammonia cracker. So this is uh, the cost there are estimated at around about 60p per kilogram of hydrogen. And that incorporates uh, a loss, a yield loss of about 15% of the hydrogen, which is actually reused in the process itself to generate the heat that's required for the endothermic ammonia cracking process. Ammonia crackers exist and have been around for quite a long time, but they're generally they're typically not at large scale. These tend to be small scale units, which are used for producing what's known as forming gas, which is um, uh, where ammonia is cracked to produce hydrogen. And this is used very commonly in the metallurgical industry and other related industries, and sometimes used in the glass industry. So it's quite a simple process and it has been around for a while but it hasn't yet been scaled up to very large scale. If we look at um, these, um, these graphs, these pictures down the bottom uh, illustrate a very important um, advantage of ammonia when you're transporting hydrogen, which is, again, it's all related to the density, the, you know, how much hydrogen can you store uh, and carry in, your, you know, in a truck. So here we've got three scenarios which have been modelled where we're talking about, for example, if you're producing ammonia in the Humber or if it's imported into the port of Humber and then transported to three cases, Birmingham, London or Aberdeen. So we're talking about distances there of 150 miles, 200 miles and 400 miles. The cost there is shown as pounds per kilogram of hydrogen delivered. So this is based on today's technology um, and today's costs. 
So we're not factoring into that any great innovation or any great, um, you know, steps forward in um, the reduction in the cost that we would see in the future. So if we were transporting uh, the uh, hydrogen in a tube trailer, then the cost there would be something like three pounds eighty delivered. Uh, if you were take going from the Humber to Birmingham, um, talking about about four pounds thirty to London, or well over seven pounds if you were shipping it to Aberdeen. All of these costs, the road transport costs, are based on the schedule of charges and costs which are published by the Freight Transport Association. So all of those costs can be uh, worked out based on the information they provide. So this takes into account the number of uh, trucks and trailers you would need, the number of drivers, shift operating patterns, etc. If we look at the uh, for the Hummer to Birmingham case, the liquid hydrogen, there the cost is even higher, primarily because of the cost of the liquefaction and the compression. So the grey part of that bar is very, very significant. So that's really what kills you there. Then if we look across to ammonia, so in this case, we've assumed clarification, the dark blue bar at the bottom is assuming we're producing the hydrogen by electrolysis. Um, and so it's the same production cost in all cases, but what we're factoring into that is the cost of uh, liquefying or and, and transporting to the source. So for the ammonia case, the Humber to Birmingham scenario, for the ammonia scenario, we've added on top of the cost of the electrolysis to produce it. We have to factor in a small loss, so that's the little orange bar, a small loss in converting the uh, hydrogen um, into ammonia. Then the road shipping costs, the road to the end user, the light blue bar, as you can see, is very, very small for ammonia because of the density of ammonia. Then there's the cost of converting cracking back to gaseous hydrogen and some of the yield losses associated with that. So even taking into account these other processes that are involved with ammonia as a hydrogen carrier, you can see we can still get the ammonia to the end user um, at that distance cheaper than you can with gaseous hydrogen or liquid hydrogen. And this, this difference becomes even more stark if you increase the distance as the costs of particularly the gaseous hydrogen transport, um, but also the liquid hydrogen, it goes up much, much more uh, than the ammonia does when you're, got, when you're looking at longer distances that you need to transport to your end user. So uh, next slide, please, Eric. Thank you. So what we're looking at here is, so we've looked at specifically what the effect of transportation distances are within the UK. So what uh, what does this tell us? Um, you know, what what can we deduce from looking in more detail at, at modelling of uh, international trade? What ammonia does is it, uh, what we'll show here is that ammonia does enable an international trade, it's effectively an international trade in energy. So instead of shipping petroleum products around the world in tankers, what we're talking about here is shipping green, zero carbon hydrogen around the world in tankers instead of uh, petroleum products. The transportation of liquid ammonia by sea is very, very low. The graph on the bottom left shows, for example, the shipping costs of transporting liquid ammonia from Qatar to the UK. So if we look at all of these costs here for shipping, the charter costs, fuel costs, sewers, canal fee, etc. We're talking about a landed, you know, the, the cost to land liquid ammonia in the UK of just over 25p per kilo. If you well, I haven't shown any graphs here for the liquid hydrogen, but if you do the same analysis for liquid hydrogen, it costs almost 10 times, sometimes even more, the cost of ammonia in terms of the hydrogen contained to ship over the same distance. 
The reason being uh, you've got the low, lower density hydrogen contained density of liquid hydrogen compared to ammonia. So you can, literally cannot get as much hydrogen on a ship uh, as you can with uh, ammonia. But also there's the fact that you need pressure vessels, you need a lot of insulation, there's the recompression cost, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, uh, it's by no means cheap transporting liquid hydrogen over large distances, even if you're doing it by ship. The full benefits of this, uh, of ammonia, of the high density, the high hydrogen density of liquid ammonia, the full benefit is achieved if you distribute the ammonia to as close as possible to the point of end use. So if you were importing liquid ammonia to ports in the UK, uh, you probably wouldn't crack it back to hydrogen at the port unless, of course, you were directly feeding it into the gas grid for heating purposes. But for all other uses, it makes uh, much more sense and is much cheaper to transport the ammonia in the liquid form to the end users. Then small, medium and large scale cracking can then be used uh, depending on what the end use is, for example, if you had a hydrogen refueling station, then you would need a relatively small cracker to convert the ammonia back into the hydrogen again uh, for use uh, for hydrogen fueling. If you wanted to use the, um, the hydrogen either for process uh, heating in large scale chemical industry or for feeding into the gas grid, then you would use a much larger scale uh, ammonia cracker. On the right hand side here, if we do a comparison of the, um, these two scenarios where we're looking at producing the ammonia, green ammonia from green electricity to produce green hydrogen in the UK versus the Middle East. So we're talking about, for example, our renewable um, load, full load hours. The, these um, input uh, numbers are taken from uh, IEA publications. For example, we're talking about solar here. The full load hours in the UK, we're using a number of 5,000. For the Middle East, we this is per year. For the Middle East, we're using 6,500. For the Middle East, or Australia, or North Africa, that's probably, well, that is a very conservative figure. Um, you may very well get 7,500 um, full load hours in those countries. If you look at the effect um, so assuming all other things equal, in other words, if we assume that we have identical capex and identical opex for very large scale combined solar and wind plus electrolysis in the UK and the Middle East, if we just simply look at the total operating hours, total load hours, then that reduces the electricity cost, as you can see on that graph, uh, to make the um, electricity cost significantly lower in the Middle East compared to in the UK or Europe. And this translates directly into a lower hydrogen cost. So here we're looking at $1.95, sorry, $1.95 per kilo for hydrogen. Sorry for using the dollars, but this is taken from OEA um, calculations and they always work in dollars. So we're talking about uh, $1.95 for hydrogen, green hydrogen in the UK production versus 150 in the Middle East, or may potentially even lower than that in the Middle East or Australia or North Africa. So that's just simply the benefit of longer load hours. There may well be other, derived, other benefits derived from locating your production of the green hydrogen in these other countries. It may well be uh, cheaper for, somewhat cheaper for CapEx and OPEX as well in these other countries. Also, that um, $26 or 2.6 cents per kilowatt hour uh, for electricity cost in the UK. Um, it, that may be a bit optimistic, may be realistic, but you know, that's one of these things that does vary a lot, and it's very much a case by case analysis here. If we look at the graph down on the bottom right hand side, we can see that. The delivered cost to the end user, in this case 150 miles from a production port. So we've got two graphs here, ammonia 
produced in the UK, ammonia in the Middle East. So within Erebars, it's very pretty much the same. Um, getting your hydrogen to the end user, ir irrespective of whether the hydrogen was produced in the UK or in the Middle East. And that's simply because the shipping cost uh, from the Middle East to the UK, the cost, that additional cost of shipping is largely compensated for by the cheaper cost of the hydrogen uh, where it's produced in the Middle East. So next slide then, please, Eric. Okay, so we're getting near the end of my time, so I'll speed up a bit. So what we've got here, okay, so what, what applications can we use green ammonia for? Well, you can use green ammonia directly in power generation. There's quite a lot of work um, being done by OEMs, equipment manufacturers, of turbines, uh, reciprocating um, engines for use in power generation, for use in ships. For example, Yara have a ship um, uh, a tanker um, for LPG and ammonia, where they've converted the engine to run on ammonia. So uh, reciprocating engines and gas turbines, you can, in some cases, you can already get these that work on ammonia, and certainly all of the OEMs are, are working on that. So we're talking about here heavy duty vehicles, trains, ships, even aircraft, You, uh, which was a, a quite a novelty to me, but if you look at the um, picture on the right hand side and the link there, you can go to that link to see more details. You can indeed use ammonia to drive turbines, uh, the the, um, the jet engines on an aircraft. You store the liquid ammonia in the wings. And of course the advantage there, it's the, um, it's not really, it's not, it's not difficult to keep the ammonia in liquid form because obviously when you're at altitude, the wing's pretty cold. You do need to pre-crack a bit of ammonia to mix in some hydrogen into that uh, fuel stream into the engine to get the right sort of flame stability, the right sort of um, flame speed, etc. But um, work is already ongoing there. And then you can crack the ammonia back into hydrogen for use in fuel cells, uh, for example, as a transport fuel or for power generation. It can also be used, ammonia in fact can be used directly if you do a small amount of pre-cracking of the ammonia. It can be used directly in alkaline or solid oxide fuel cells. Um, and obviously, you know, cracking and injecting into the gas grid for industrial and domestic heat uses. The next slide, please, Eric. Great. So here we'll go on to um, quick summary and conclusions here. So what I hope I've shown in this presentation is that ammonia has the potential to improve the economics, in this case, what I mean is delivered cost, the economics of large scale centralized low or zero carbon hydrogen production by enabling access to users which are distant from the source. So that can be users a long way, a long way from the source of the green hydrogen, for example, within the UK or even internationally. Um, you know, importing from the Middle East, a lot of talk going on in using exactly this to transport hydrogen in the form of ammonia from Australia to Japan. So this would enable an international trade in low and zero carbon energy to replace the current international trade in hydrocarbons. Ammonia can already be directly used in conventional combustion systems and ammonia can be used in fuel cells, either as it is or after converting it back to hydrogen. Another side benefit is that the use of ammonia as an energy carrier will also support the decarbonisation of ammonia uh, in its existing major industry, which is fertiliser production, which currently accounts for, depending on the source of your information, from 1% to 2% of global CO2. So if you're interested to see a lot more detail about this is available um, in this green hydrogen report. The link is there to a report that myself and my colleagues co-authored and you can go directly to that link on, on the Bayes website and download it. So um, next slide please Eric. So I'd like to finish up with um, some next steps. So I mean this all looks great so far but there's still more to do in order to see ammonia used as uh, as an enabler of uh, green hydrogen. 
obviously we need a strategy to decarbonise ammonia production in the UK itself. Um, we need to uh, develop end use opportunities for decarbonised ammonia beyond just the main use of fertilisers. So work is ongoing in these areas, uh, but much more impetus is needed. We need to work on defining how the UK would participate in and benefit from this international trade in low or zero carbon hydrogen, which would be enabled by the use of ammonia. This is an area where the UK could significantly benefit, but obviously we don't want to leave it too long to uh, develop a strategy here. And then on the more technical side, obviously further work, ongoing work is needed to develop for development of ammonia relevant technologies on the, in the UK. In this case, it's very much a case of not inventing, you don't really need to invent anything particularly new. It's just modifying, improving existing technologies um, in order to use the uh, ammonia. So direct use of the ammonia in transport and power generation, so road transport, marine and aviation. And then the use of ammonia in fuel cells for power generation. So, well, an important area there, if you're going to use the hydrogen in PEM fuel cells, you cannot afford to have any ammonia, trace ammonias even, you know, you need to get down to low PPB levels if you're going to use uh, that hydrogen in fuel cells. Well, but you can more or less directly, using a pre-cracker, feed them into alkaline and solid oxide fuel cell. And further work needs to, to be done on optimising and scaling up the cracker technology. So with that, um, I'm, if we've slightly run out of time, but if there are any questions, then um, I will have a look at that, looking at the questions here. So we have um, quite a few questions, actually. <laughs> Uh, so one of the questions is, um, would, would uh, we favour using ammonia as a transport solution or more as a fuel itself? Um, if it's just for transport, the energy to transform in and out of ammonia, what distance transport does it become worthwhile? But as you can see from those slides earlier, you don't need to talk about very much longer distances before um, economic, you know, before it becomes noticeably economic to use ammonia uh, versus transporting hydrogen, for example, in tube trailers. So once you get over, it's probably about 100 miles, then it's, it starts to, you know, it definitely swings in the favour of ammonia. Where, da, da, da. Another question as to whether we've modelled sea freight option for ammonia, where the ship consumes the ammonia it's shipping as a fuel. So in the analysis that we showed, that I showed in the presentation there, we, the costs there, uh, for example, from shipping from far to the UK, that was just based on existing um, quoted shipping costs um, that, are, that are available, in which case the engines of the ships would just be running on bunker fuel. Obviously, there's a definite carbon advantage if you could run off the ammonia that you're transporting. And indeed, as I mentioned, Yara, uh, obviously major international manufacturing transporter of ammonia, have already worked together with, I think it's MAN, to convert maritime engines to run directly on ammonia. And, uh, so we have another question that uh, ammonia is obviously an excellent fuel in its own right, and ammonia hydrogen mixtures offer an extra dimension in the zero carbon fuel options. So there's not, it's not always necessary to turn the ammonia into hydrogen to use it. As I showed in the slide, there's many cases where you can use the ammonia directly, the green ammonia directly, or maybe pre-crack a small amount of the ammonia uh, to perform, to give you some hydrogen as well as ammonia if you need to tweak the fuel mixture in order to have, uh, you know, a good stable flame fronts, etc. So yes. Um, that's the advantage of ammonia is, you know, a very good vector for both for hydrogen, but for use in its own right. So it's a very flexible fuel there. Another question, has analysis, has analysis been done on um, an, um, transporting hydrogen as ammonia versus hydride for transport? 
um, uh, to be honest, I don't know. It may well have been, um, but there's pros and cons, obviously. The advantage of liquid ammonia is your tra everything you transport, you know, in terms of the liquid ammonia you use, whereas with metal hydrides, you're transporting the hydrogen to the end location, you dehydride the metal hydride, and then you have to transport your empty metal hydride, which is fairly heavy, back to be filled up with hydrogen again. So there's an issue there. If you're talking about the um, total hydrogen content, well, ammonia is NH3, so you can work out the weight percentage of hydrogen there. It's what, 17 or so percent. So metal hydrides, I guess, you know, you can get them over a range of a few percent up to maybe 20 percent. Um, so, but then again, as I say, there's the issue, as I said, there's the issue with hydrides, both in terms of the fact you have to look at the whole round trip efficiency when you're using a metal hydride. Um, and then also there's, there's tends, there can be significant heat transfer issues and crepitation and attrition issues with hydrides you need to be aware of. The final question, uh, unless any others pop up. Uh, how much retrofitting is needed to retrofit the internal combustion engine of current chips to use ammonia as a fuel? I'm, I'm, I'm not. A, I'm a chemical engineer, not a mechanical engineer, so I don't really know. But if you Google that, I, I think I saw a reference to a man working on this, and there may be other uh, manufacturers of maritime ICN, ICE engines. So, and I'm sure there's technical literature out there. Uh, as to what needs to be done to um, to repurpose and modify uh, maritime engines, my un my my sort of very cursory top level understanding is that it's really just a case of modifications uh, of existing engines. I I don't believe they've had to redesign or rebuild anything from scratch. Um, I believe it's just a modification. So I think uh, that looks like the end of the questions unless anybody else um, comes in at the last minute. So I'd like to thank everybody very much, uh, both for um, the input and the feedback and questions for my presentation, as well as the participation all day long. Uh, so um, I found as a, as a chair of the session today and on Tuesday, I found it very interesting. I learned a lot of new things and I hope that all of the participants did as well. So Eric uh, will circulate um, links, I assume, for the um, recordings of sessions uh, today and on Tuesday, as well as slides. Uh, so that will come out in due course. So thanks again to everybody for their participation. And we uh, will continue on next week.